for what they hope is a big night of Rocky Top. And leading the ball walk, first-year head coach Lane Kiffin looking for his first SEC win. Another first-year head coach coming in with an undefeated Auburn team in Gene Chizik. It's a big night, the SEC on ESPN. It's Auburn and Tennessee next. Time presented by Hampton Hotels with a full moon over the Tennessee River and a packed house at Neyland Stadium. This is going to be a great way for our first Saturday night of October. The SEC on ESPN, our matchup is Auburn and Tennessee, and we welcome you to Knoxville, everybody. I'm Brad Nessler. My partner's Todd Blackledge. We've seen Tennessee once already this year. Lane Kiffin said what it's been has been like this, up and down. He's hoping it's one of those up nights tonight against Auburn. What we didn't know, that Auburn was going to be 4-0 at this point, Todd, and have one of the highest scoring offenses in the country. Well, you know, Gus Malzahn, the new offensive coordinator, wherever he has been, his offense has been explosive and unorthodox. I watched all four games games on tape and there are certain characteristics about this offense to watch tonight. Number one, the quarterback is almost exclusively in the shotgun. You'll see a ton of shifts and motions, play fakes, misdirection. The offense is also extremely balanced. The yardage is just about even run pass, but the most defining characteristic of this offense is the tempo that they play with. There's a lot of offenses that go no huddle. There's a lot of teams that like to play up tempo. Right. Nobody that I've seen plays at the kind of breakneck pace that this team likes to play at. The thing I like, it's a high-powered offense and a hurry-up offense against the wily old veteran yeah. Monty Kiffin on defense for Tennessee. When Monty Kiffin got the job in the summer, the two teams he spent the most time preparing for were Florida and Auburn. Auburn. Two weeks ago, they didn't win, but they controlled the Florida offense by limiting big plays. Same formula is required tonight. The only problem is they're missing one of their key ingredients. With more on that, third member of our team, Aaron Andrews. Brad, a big challenge for Tennessee's defense. They're without their middle linebacker, Nick Raves. Savvy Frazier moves in from the outside. And while head coach Lane Kiffin says he's a good athlete, he just hasn't played this position since sixth grade. Coach Kiffin says that's why I need this home crowd to be loud on every single down. So this Auburn's offense will have a hard time communicating tonight. They want the loud crowd. They've got the loud crowd. Tennessee will run through the tee in a moment, trying to snap a four-game losing skid against Auburn. Smokey's ready. 102,000 are ready. And now Lane Kiffin and the Volunteers are ready. The first trip for Auburn to Knoxville in five years. Tennessee wants to make it an unhappy experience. Coming up tonight, that high-octane offense, averaging 45 points a game. Best way to beat them, keep them off the field with Montario Hardesty and some ball control. Elsewhere tonight, USC and Oklahoma have big tests. We'll keep you posted. And how about Todd Blackledge? He's gained a couple pounds in Knoxville. The reason being, his taste of the town is pretty impressive. It's the SEC. ESPN's College Football Primetime, brought to you by Dr. Pepper. Drink it slow, doctor's orders. What a spectacle. A lot of orange in Neyland Stadium tonight for the 51st meeting between the Tigers and the Volunteers. And these schools dominated the SEC in the mid to late 80s. Hasn't been quite that good lately. That's why we've got two first-year head coaches, Lane Kiffin on Tennessee side, Gene Chizik on Auburn side. Not the first time for Gene to be a head coach after two years at Iowa State, but his return now to Auburn and the fans sometimes weren't that crazy about the choice. It looks yeah. pretty good right now. Right now it looks pretty good. I talked to Jay Jacobs down on the field, the athletic director. He said, yeah, I feel pretty good about my decision at this point. And uh, Gene Chizik is uh, 
A little lo more low key than Lane Kiffin as they came into oh, these jobs. Was I that guess the that's an understatement easy... <laughs> of the first five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Lane is a little more boisterous, no doubt. Gene, the low key approach. Lane is full blast at you, as everybody knows, I think. And the last time they really squared off against each other, one was the offensive coordinator in the national title game for Texas, or the defensive coordinator, Gene Chizik. And the offensive coordinator for USC was Lane Kiffin. So they've been in battle before as assistant coaches, but this is a whole different deal. Auburn won the toss and deferred. So that means the Tigers will kick away to Gerald Jones and David Oku. Great kick it is to open. It's going to chase Tennessee two yards deep. And Oku will bring it out, the freshman. And he's got a little bit of room all the way to the 35. A 35-yard return. Coach Kiffin with his offensive line and his offense around him. And they'll have a good spot to work from the 35-yard line. Made a couple changes up front. Uh, started last week, actually. A new left guard, Corey Sullins. His twin brother, Cody, is the center. And a new right tackle starting last week, Aaron Douglas, who's a true freshman. So they're, they're pretty excited about the combination they have up there right now. And they immediately come out in a wildcat set. Dukes Richardson's got some room. He's got great speed. Richardson all the way to the 25. If you wondered, as we did, how come Jonathan Crompton was spending so much time talking <laughs> with his head coach? It's because he was on the sideline, and the freshman, Nukees Richardson, was out there for a big game. Well, and Jim Chaney, the offensive coordinator, said, we need to get some more explosive plays in this offense. It's hard to score without explosive plays. How about the first play out of the box? A big-time run. 41 yards down inside the Auburn 25, and now it's Crompton who swings the pass out to Quentin Hancock. And Hancock playing with a broken jaw, believe it or not. He's their biggest receiver and most physical. Here's the first play from scrimmage. Well, they got him out flanked, but then Nuki saw a, a seam back to the backside. And you mentioned the great speed. Almost took this all the way to the house, but Nico Thorpe did a nice job of tracking him down. But that was a great way to start the game for Tennessee and an offense that just hasn't had a lot of big-time plays. Now they have a conventional set in there, although they're shifting out of that again, and they take Hardesty and the fullback both to the wide side of the field. Somebody's trying to come back this way, and finally Hardesty sets up empty backfield for Crompton on second down and eights. Across the middle, too high, intended for Hancock again. A little too high and a little too hard for Jonathan Crompton on that one. Good to see Hancock back in the lineup for Tennessee. There was some question how much he could play or if he would play. Had a fractured jaw in the Florida game two weeks ago, but is back out there uh, early in this ball game. So a third down and long after all the excitement on the first snap of the ball game. Denarius Moore joins the wide receiver core. And Crompton will work from the shotgun. Going left and incomplete in town. Tended for Gerald Jones. And Jones bumped a little bit by Walter McFadden. So all that yep. excitement of the first play. And now they're going to have to settle for a field goal attempt. It was good defense by Auburn. They brought a corner blitz from the opposite side. Played a little zone behind it, and even if that pass is completed to Jones, it's tackled well short of the first down. You saw Daniel Lincoln, six out of seven on the year. This will be a 39-yard field goal attempt. They try to put Tennessee on the board first. The kick on the way, and it is no good. Wide left. Uh, kind of a line drive. And Lane Kiffin, you can tell by the look on his face, we got him on one play, and then we let him off the hook.
So now Gene Chizik's Auburn Tigers are going to take over at their 23 yard line. And we mentioned the pace. I mean, that, that is the thing that Gus Malzahn wants to do. He wants to get up to the line of scrimmage after the play is over, get the play called, and get it snapped as quick as possible. So here's Auburn on offense for the first time with Chris Todd. And a handoff to Tate. Tate's got a little opening off the left side, got about two. Art Evans made the stop defensively for the Volunteers. All three of these guys, both teams with good tailbacks. Hardesty number one in the conference in Russia. Tate's number three. And Ontario McCaleb's number four. So we've got three of the top four rushers in the conference on either side tonight. So Auburn stays right there at the line with a second down and eight. They fake the handoff to McCaleb, and now Todd's got a wide open guy over in the flat, and that's McCaleb down the sideline and out of bounds with a first down. So the freshman, who I just mentioned, the number four rusher in the conference, picks up 24 yards as the pass receiver. There's a lot of motion, a lot of movement. They fake the handoff to McCaleb, and then he just sits out here as an outlet. Well, that's even better than an outlet because nobody ran out with him from the Tennessee defense from the inside out. And again, as Aaron mentioned, the absence of Revez, the linebacker, might have been a part of that. And now on a big play coming back to the left side is Trevante Stallworth. So Auburn using everybody here on their opening drive. Yeah, this was the, the little trick play. The, the quarterback's going to put the ball in the, right there in the hands. It's almost <laughs> like the old fumble Ruski, yep. but not quite. Yep, he's got to hand it to him. He can't put it on the ground and pick it up. Gus Malzahn's offense, very unorthodox and uh, very hard to prepare for because you're just not used to seeing some of the stuff they do. So first down again for Todd. Rides it to Tate and throws it out in the flat. Oh, what a hit by LaMarcus Thompson. A loss of three. Well, the pressure on Chris Todd is what, what created this play. Chris Todd had to get rid of the football to an outlet receiver, but that time there was a linebacker, Thompson, who was out there with the outlet receiver. Thompson, the junior out of Lithonia, Georgia, put the wood to him. You look behind Tate and Todd on a second and 14 now. Todd, the deep drop, and the deep ball on the sideline got him in again, and it's Fannin, who he just threw it to, and Fannin didn't worry about getting leveled on the previous play. There's 25 yards. Well, again, the third guy out kind of got lost in this Tennessee defense. There is a flag down. And it's coming back. The two receivers run the corner and the safety off. Nobody goes with the fullback, Fannin, as he comes out of the backfield, but... This one's coming back, but we're, we're seeing right now Tennessee missing some guys in this Auburn offense. Tom Ritter is our referee, wanting the defensive captain, who is Eric Berry, and he's giving him his options. And here's the call. Personal foul, shot block, number 50, offense, 15-yard penalty. Second down. Ryan Pugh, the center, with the chop block. Let's take a look at Auburn's impact players. We already see Ontario McCaleb with a big pass reception. He's a freshman. Darrell Zachary, two touchdowns last week through the air. You got to look out for this guy on defense. AC Antonio Coleman. You always have to know where he is from his defensive end spot. So Auburn's got second down and 29. You see Chris Todd looking to the sideline for a change of play. They don't do this often. Most of their plays are predetermined, but they will do this on occasion. Look to the sideline to Gus Malzahn for an audible. You see the defenders of Tennessee asking for more noise. Here's a little option to Tate on the corner. Got around one man, got a good block. And he backpedals to about the 50-yard line. Pickup of nine. There's and Gus Malzahn. A very successful high school coach at Springdale, Arkansas. Got hired by Houston Nutt at Arkansas. Spent one year there. There were some issues there between he and Houston Nutt. Left there and went to Tulsa and uh, did a great job at Tulsa the last two years. 
They were number one in the country in total offense the last two years. Tulsa. Monty Kiffin said, I don't care where he came from. If he came from high school, wherever he came from, the guy can coach. Yep. Third and a mile for Auburn. Here comes the corner pressure. Pass is complete to Tate. He gets it inside the 40, still fighting for yardage. He'll be stopped at about the 38-yard line. So that's going to bring up fourth down. There's Monty Kiffin, the wily old veteran and father of the head coach, Lane, if you don't know that. Yeah. I'll tell you what, this, this showed me how much respect Monty Kiffin has for Gus Malzahn. You think, oh, this guy's 26 years in the NFL. He th they might think of this guy as kind of a high school hairy coach. Before the game, he was over there talking to him on the field, paying his respects. Here's a big fourth down. They're out of field goal range. They've only picked up one fourth down conversion out of five tries so far through four weeks. This looks like it would be a quick kick the way they're lined up. Might be a quick punt. There it goes. And Todd knocks it down too far. So that'll put Tennessee on offense, setting up shop at their own 20-yard line when we come back. No score so far here early in the first quarter. They're coming off a big win. Brett Favre, can he do it to his old team, Green Bay? Or will Aaron Rodgers be the man? Rivals clash, epic Monday night battle tomorrow night. Uh, Monday night, I should say. Packers and Vikings, 8.30 Eastern time. Coverage starts with Monday night countdown served by Applebee's at 7 Eastern. And the team from Wisconsin had the better of it in the Big Ten today. That's right. It's Wisconsin-Minnesota weekend. Badgers over the Gophers this afternoon in a game that went down to a fantastic finish pickup of about two for Ontario Hardesty. Let's take a look at Tennessee's impact players tonight. Though Hardesty's the main man, I got to think one of these games, Bryce Brown, the freshman, is going to spring out and have a big play. Gerald Jones back in the lineup. After having some injury problems, they really need him on the outside. And Rico McCoy, number two tackler on this team behind Eric Berry, and he's an impact guy off the corner from his outside linebacker position. Second down, Crofton took a hit as he let it go, and it's almost intercepted. Walter McFadden tipped it, almost tipped it to himself. Well, the pressure affected the vision of Jonathan Crompton, and he's had a problem throwing it to the wrong jerseys this year. He's already thrown eight interceptions and was not able to get that thrown on time, and that enabled McFadden to slip underneath and almost get the pick. There's the numbers on Jonathan Crompton, and most of the good news came in the opener against Western Kentucky. It's been mostly bad news the last three weeks. Got to roll away from the pressure here on third down. It fires on the sideline, completes, and it's caught by Gerald Jones. But it's going to be short of the first down. The real challenge for Auburn's defense tonight will be stopping the run on first down. They come into this game giving up an average of 154 yards per game. But if they can slow down Tennessee on first down running it, then they get this offense right where they want them on third down. Chad Cunningham comes in the punt, averaging just under 41 a kick. And this is not a good one. Off the side of his foot. And it's going to bounce at the 43 and go out of bounds at the 44. Only a 27-yard punt. It'll be great field position for the Auburn offense when we return. 8-31 remaining first quarter, no score. The bud. If never taken in the Smoky Mountain National Park in Tennessee, do so sometime. Gorgeous sights from today on a picture-perfect day. Picture-perfect Auburn offense compared to a year ago, Todd. Yeah, outstanding. I mean, the numbers are just off the charts in what Gus Malzahn has brought here. Number three in the country in total offense, number three in scoring offense. 27 points behind what they did all of last year. That gives you an indication. Here comes an end around and a pass to boot from Cody Burns. And he got it out complete to the 40-yard line to Terrell Zachary. That's what Cody Burns can give you because he was the quarterback, battled for the quarterback position. Now he's Mr. Everything. Well, they moved him to wide receiver 
but he's got the versatility that Gus Malzahn wants out of his wideouts. Guys that can play running back, guys that can play quarterback. We'll also see him in the Wildcat formation taking snaps from the center. Showed you his arm on that play. He threw all the way back across the field, a 17-yard pickup and a first down at the Tennessee 39. Actually seeing a much slower pace out of Auburn this game, and they're going to have to call a timeout here. So the Tigers take their first timeout. Cody Burns battling with Chris Todd early in the summer sessions to try to win the quarterbacking job when they found out after about nine practices that Todd would be the man. Some guys would go into just a funk. Cody Burns didn't do that. He talked to the team. The bottom line is it's about all of them. It's not about one guy. It's not about the quarterback position. It's about us winning games. So, I mean, it hurts. It hurts me. I know it hurts Neil. You cannot let your circumstances dictate who I am. So I'm going to be whatever it is going to be for me. I'm going to be cheering for Chris. I'm behind him 100%. And y'all need to be behind him 100% as well. You want about 85 of those yep. guys on your team, don't you? Well, and, and that's why Cody Burns is looked at as one of the top leaders on this football team because of that attitude, and that's what he's carried on to the practice field and, and into games. Whatever the team needs him to do, he's willing to do. Cody's a wide out to the bottom of your screen to the left of Todd on a first and 10 at the Tennessee 39-yard line. Blitz coming off the corner. Tate's going to run right past that and pick up close to 10 more. An offensive line, Zambun, Barry, and Pugh, and Eddins, McCain. You take a look at the Auburn offense at the top of, their, uh, top of the screen. Second down and one, and now, as Tate got popped, lost his helmet. Yeah, I think he got the first down and lost his helmet. He'll take that. <laughs> When Eric Berry hits you, it usually, you feel it. <laughs> Eric Berry, when he puts that shoulder into you, it leaves an impression. First down inside the 29-yard line now. Again, Burns in motion. Todd's going to fire high and over the top of everybody. Talking about Eric Berry. When we talked to him yesterday, he comes in as a leading tackler on this Tennessee team. 31 coming into the game. I said, you know, that's probably not good that you're the leading tackler. And he looked at me, he said, why not? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, see, the thing about him in Monty Kiffin's defense, he lines up in a linebacker position as much as he does a safety. Now, on this play, he's back here. But you'll also see him up around the line of scrimmage quite a bit during this game. So the SEC Defensive Player of the Year squared me off pretty well yesterday yeah. for that answer. Why not? Second and ten. The crowd trying to help now. Going to have to hurry to get the playoff. They do just barely. They were offsides. Tennessee trying to bring some pressure from the outside. I think Dennis Rogan, number 41, got a little bit of head start across the, uh, across the line of scrimmage. You're right, that's the call. And though they gained seven yards, they'll no doubt take the penalty to keep the down, I would think. Rogan was not uh, in the lineup for Monty Kiffin's defense last week, a one-game suspension, but he's back in there, and they need him back in that secondary. I think they're going to do what I said. Bring it back. Offside. Number 41 defense, five-yard penalty, first down. No, it's not first down, I don't think. It's it's second down. But you take the five instead of the seven and not lose the down. They got it straight. So second down at five. And well, now the officials are going to halt things again. Talked about the pace that Auburn likes to play with. One of the things that ideally, in a perfect world for them, they would not substitute personnel. They want to recruit personnel to Auburn that can stay on the field, that same 11, because that allows them to line up and play even faster. Because if they substitute, 
the officials have to allow Tennessee or any defense an ample amount of time to make substitution to match the personnel. But if you don't substitute, then it's on the defense to get ready to play fast as you play. Now they wind the clock. I'm not sure why the officials slowed things down, but it did give Todd a chance to run over and talk to the coaches on the sideline. Now you see virtually every player looks to that sideline. The two tackles get up and look at their quarterback. And now they're set to go with one second left on the play clock. Swing pass out to Fanner. And I think there was movement in the interior of the uh, Auburn offensive line. Again, they're pressing the issue down to the last second. That doesn't Hard help their the cause. Snap, false start, 75 offense, five-yard penalty, second down. Well, they got the five back from Rogan's offside penalty on Tennessee, and we're right about back where we started. And that is just inside the 29-yard line. Again, all the skilled people look to the sideline with the two tackles looking at the quarterback. And Tennessee again asking for more noise. Todd going deep to the corner and out of bounds. Darvin Adams caught the ball, but he's out of bounds. He ran out of real estate, and Rogan was back there with him. I think that right now, at least in this first quarter, that Auburn is slowing their pace down some and changing plays at the line of scrimmage to maybe settle the team down and offset the crowd noise. But uh, this is a little bit different than what they've done in previous games. They're looking over to the sideline just about every play so far here in the first quarter. Auburn came in 50% on their third down conversions. A big one here on third and ten. Blitz off the corner. Todd in trouble. Lost it and got it to his tight end. Tommy Trotz got a first down. Boy, credit Chris Todd for knowing where he could go with the ball. He had two unblocked defenders coming at him. He knew he had to get rid of it. And he knew where Tommy Trott was right in the middle. His biggest receiver or target out there. And he's able to get him the football. So now they've got it down to the red zone at the 16-yard line of Tennessee. They go back to Tate. And Tate goes straight up the middle. Pick up of about four. Okay, so let's watch now as the clock is running. That's how much time it's taking. All right, so you got one coach signaling. You have two players that have kind of a numbering system and a color-coded system that are signaling plays into Chris Todd and the rest of the offense. That's the amount of time from when the last play stops. And the ball was placed until they get up to the line to snap it again. Eighth play of the drive. Here's Cody Burns again wanting to throw. And he's going to have to throw this one away. So he completed his first pass. He does have one touchdown pass so far this year. And right now, for whatever reason, and I'm sure Gus Malzahn has thought about it and studied it, they are not doing what they have done in the previous four games in terms of their pace. They, they wanted to try to get the play called and snap it, you know, in 10 to 15 seconds after the, the previous play was done. They're taking a lot more time and trying to be sure that they have the play called and communicated that they want. Well, this is a different pace than what Auburn has played with. Remember, this is their first road game, too. Yeah, that's right. Third down and six. Todd throws incomplete fan of the intended receiver. And it'll bring up fourth down. Nice job in coverage by Rico McCoy, one of their senior leaders, a senior linebacker, led the team last week with eight tackles in their win over Ohio. And Probably feels he needs to pick up his game a little bit as well with Frazier moving inside to the new middle linebacker position. Guys like Gary Perry and Rico McCoy have to play harder. West Byram hasn't missed so far this year. It's a 29-yard field goal attempt. They were a man short on their front wall. They get that straightened out. And the kick on the way, and this one is good. So Auburn strikes first. Took it down the field, had to settle for three. Tennessee's turn on offense when we come back in a minute.
at Neyland Stadium in Knoxville where the Tigers went 44 yards in 10 plays in three and a half minutes. They had to settle for a 29 yard field goal but they're on the board first. Smokey looking for something to go right at home. Morgan Hall will tee it up. Tennessee has basically had one big play on offense and that was the first snap in a Wildcat formation into Keith Richardson who took it 41 yards. Todd I got to think they've got to start trying to get it to Ontario Hardesty yep. and start pounding away and see what happens. Uh, I think so and if they want to throw they better do it early. Here's a kick to the five to Richardson. Dangerous return man too. In the middle of the pile got it out to about the 31 yard line. Well. You're living in the Chicagoland area. You want to check out your favorite teams. You want to check out ESPNChicago.com for local coverage of the Bears, Bulls, Cubs, Sox, Blackhawks, all the college football teams, including Notre Dame. Northwestern, a winner today. Illinois didn't. And coming soon, ESPN.com for Dallas, New York, and L.A. Another Notre Dame comeback for Jimmy Clausen and company today in overtime to win. Whoops, ball on the ground. And I'm not sure who's got it. Well, Brandon Warren tried to scoop and keep running with it instead of just falling on the loose ball. That's why there's some confusion right now. And now we're pushing bodies out of there. Still no official signal from our officials. Now we got one. Auburn football. There's an excited coach who says, I always look through defensive glasses when I'm watching a game. Well, that yeah, was a bad exchange, and, and Crompton never had it clean, and Josh Bynes is the guy who's going to come out of there with the football. You see Brandon Warren, instead of just falling on it, he tried to pick it up and run and advance the football and never got a handle on it, and Auburn with a big-time turnover. Auburn came in number one in the SEC in turnover margin. Tennessee minus three. You can add another one to it right there. And now a golden opportunity for Auburn to try to put more points up in a hurry. They come with the end around. And McCaleb goes out of bounds as we go out to Reese Davis. All right, Brad, put your finger on the prime time pulse. Oklahoma and Miami. Sooners on the move. Dominique Franks intercepted Ja'Cory Harris early, and now Oklahoma's just picked up a first down. Most seeing that on ABC. On ESPN2, Ryan Mallett just threw a touchdown pass to Anthony Curtis. Shootout with AM. It's 14 to 10, and Ole Miss is beating up on Vanderbilt on the U. All right, race here. It's Tennessee beating up on Ben Tate on uh, that carry. A loss of four. When Tennessee played so well against Florida two weeks ago, it really started up front. They, they kind of controlled things at the line of scrimmage and had great gap control against the, the Florida run. Right now, Auburn's got them a little bit more spread out than Florida did a couple weeks ago. Third down at six, trying to take advantage of the fumble recovery. Todd fires had it batted down at the line of scrimmage. Gerald Williams was over there and Wes Brown was as well. Nice job by Gerald Williams. He felt the cut block coming. You tell the linemen to kind of fire out and get those guys hands down, get your helmet into their legs. He felt the cut block coming. He kept separated and timed his jump to get a hand on the football. Gerald switching back and forth from linebacker to defensive end in the spring. Big play there as he sprung up to knock that ball down and force a field goal attempt of 43 yards by Byram, who hit earlier from 39. This one on the way, and he's two for two on the night. So 43-yard field goal attempt. That's not too bad a damage considering where Tennessee put it on the carpet. Yeah, that, that's kind of a win for the Tennessee defense when you consider where that turnover occurred and where Auburn took possession of the football. And they've got to take care of the football. I mean, that, that is number one priority for this Tennessee offense, for Jonathan Thompson, the quarterback, to take care of the football. Well, now we're going to see if 
they can go to the ground game. I know that, that they want to yeah. do that. Obviously, with Monterey Hardesty coming off a huge game, career high game for right. him last week, they got to establish a running game somehow. That's their strength. They've got to get that running game going, and then that will help Jonathan Crompton make some throws off of play action. They're not going to beat many teams right now, right. just dropping back and throwing and getting into third down in tough situations. But if they can throw some play action on early downs and establish their run, uh, then they've got a chance. Well, we've seen that Jonathan Crompton is not the greatest third down quarterback in college football. And uh, his coach knows that, too. And we talked with Lane Kippen about it yesterday. And, you know, I said, we all said to Lane, you don't, you don't have Matt Leiner, and you don't have John David Booty, and you don't have those guys you were coaching at uh, SC back in the day. He'd like to have one of those, yeah. obviously. But he does have a couple good tailbacks and a pretty physical offensive line right now. Exactly. So Hall with his second kick just in the last couple of minutes. David Oku, the other freshman on the return. Oh, he was one guy away from picking up at least 10 more yards. He got 23 on the return. There's Crompton, last second word from Lane Kiffin. This is kind of what I was talking about. I, I hate to bring this type of thing up, but that's the truth. Yeah. And, and that's why they need to try to avoid those situations as much as possible. And it's not just him. No. It's their whole passing game. It's young receivers. It's having the proper splits, running the proper depth of routes. Everybody kind of focuses on the quarterback, but it's not all him in the problems in their passing game. They shift into Bryce Brown, the freshman tailback in the eye. And he'll get a handle here. Nice run by Brown. Picked up seven. See, this is what they need to do. This is the strength of their team, it is two really good running backs, one freshman, one a senior, a pretty physical offensive line where they've had to move some guys around, but they, they've got a pretty good group up in there. And then that will enable them to take some shots down the field off of play action after Auburn has to come up and maybe commit extra people to the run. So now they've got the short yardage. Had it on second yeah. down. Now they don't. Ball start. 78 offense, five-yard penalty. They just moved Aaron Douglas out there to start at right tackle last week. The redshirt freshman, and he played pretty well. But he's the guy that got the early jump. So instead of second down at three, it's second down at eight. Well, they're really high on Aaron Douglas. He actually switched in the spring from tight end to offensive tackle. You can see he's a little bit lean for an offensive tackle, but he's a young guy that they think is going to be a great player. His dad was an offensive lineman, a starter here in the 1980s. Hardesty now back in at tailback. And here's Ontario coming off a 20 carry, 140 yard game in the win over Ohio last week. He's had kind of a tough week. He had a bad shoulder last week. They drained his knee back yeah. on Monday. And when he talked with us yesterday, I said, how you feel? I'm ready to go. Yeah. So They actually hoped to try to protect him last week. He only had three carries in the first half last week. But the game was a lot closer against Ohio than they wanted it to be. And they had to feed him the ball in the second half. And he responded with a physical style of running despite those injuries. And 17 second half carries last week was the necessity for him. Now it's Oku who's in there. And it's Crompton who wants to swing it to him. And he hit him right in the rear end with that pass. And now the fans are going to get on number eight. And they've been doing that for a couple of years. Yeah, but that that he had to do that. Antonio Coleman made a great play. The defensive end, who's a big pass rusher, you're trying to invite him to rush the passer and throw the swing right over his head. He read the play, and then he went and defended the pass. Watch, he came off his pass rush, and he forced Jonathan Crompton to throw the football away. So another punting situation for Cunningham. Pierre Lewis back deep. Better kick this time, but they almost got to him. They're going to have to clear out and let this one roll. Takes a Tennessee bounce down to about the 17-yard line. 51 yards that time with the kick and the carry with 141 remaining in the quarter. Let's check in with Reese Davis again. Reese, what do you got? And Brad, USC and Cal after Cal's Kevin Riley threw an interception in the end zone. USC marched right down the field. And Joe McKnight takes off on a spectacular run. 
Watch the dive at the end. They initially ruled him out of bounds. Looked at it again. That's a touchdown, kids. 7 0 Trojans. Landry Jones hit Cameron Kenny for a score, and Oklahoma's up on Miami by a touch. All right, here at 6 0, they got a couple of Auburn field goals, and they're back on offense, and they're back running it with the freshman, the Caleb, who got about two. Here's one of the things that people probably don't know about this Auburn offense. I mean, they come into the game averaging 526 yards a game. But they are a power running football team, first and foremost. Coming into the game, 186 runs, 113 passes. It's not just a passing offense. It's a run offense, even though they do all this stuff with the bells and whistles in motion. Tony Burns now is a wide receiver now. Todd scanning the field. Has plenty of time. Throws it away. So nice job by the Tennessee yep. secondary. Excellent coverage downfield. And right now, what, what Tennessee is having some success on is on first and second down, they're doing a pretty good job. They've settled into this game. And third down, even though Auburn has come into this game averaging, converting 50% on third down, it's, it's very different. Third and one to six, third and seven plus for this team. They're not nearly as effective. They're in that plus category here. Third down and eight. Final minute of the first quarter. Todd pressured this time. Got away from one. Throwing on the run and incomplete. Eric Berry got a hand on it. The pressure from Dan Williams forced Chris Todd to move up in the pocket, ruined the timing of the route. And then anytime you throw against Eric Berry, uh, that, that's taking a risk. He's trying to hit his tight end, Tommy Trott. Eric Berry read the eyes of the quarterback and slipped right underneath to get his hands on the ball. Ledge Todd started three for three. He's now one for his last seven. Yep. Clinton Durst to punt. Lucas Richardson back. Oh, they got close. Another end over end kick. And it's going to bounce out of bounds at about the 46 yard line. So only a 35 yard punt there and good field position for the Tennessee offense if they can get something going. Here's some guys that know how to get things going. Guys like Jimmy Johnson, Mark Martin and company. Chase for the NASCAR Sprint Cup continues in Kansas tomorrow. Coverage starts Sunday, 1 o'clock Eastern on ABC. There's your leader, Mark Martin. Jimmy Johnson has his sights set on another championship. He's the defending champ. And a penalty marker on that last play. Dead ball, personal foul, number 17 on the return team, 15 yards, first half. Pretty hard to get a personal foul on a punt that goes out of bounds. Yeah. Well, Tennessee coming into the game has done a great job of not being penalized. Uh, really one of the best in the league, but that's a costly one because the, after the poor punt, they had the ball right around midfield, and now they start right outside their 30. They were only averaging three and a half penalties a game, and they got three in the first quarter. Hardesty gets out to the 35. Craig Stevens knocked him off his pins. And we've got an Auburn guy down, and it's McFadden in the corner. One of the captains of the defense. And we'll check on Walter when we return. 36 seconds remaining in the first quarter here in Knoxville. On ESPN 2. Now this is a big loss defensively for the Auburn defense. Their senior captain out of Pompano Beach, Florida, Walter McFadden, favoring the knee as he comes off. Right at the end of the play, he goes into tackle, and it's kind of hard to see what. I don't what know happened. if he just got his cleat caught in the turf or what. Hmm. But, Almost looked like there was going to be some friendly fire there, but I don't think the other Auburn guy flying by actually hit his leg. But as you mentioned now, the, the depth issue, a problem for this Auburn defense. Demond Washington, number 14, is now in at corner. 
Here's a throw behind Brandon Warren. And incomplete. Jonathan Crompton just can't get it cranking so far. Two out of seven. And he's got a third down and long again. And we talked about his third down situations. In the bottom ten of the country converting third downs. He's got third and six here. And he's going to have an empty backfield from which to throw. Five wideouts. Crompton across the middle and this one a little bit behind the intended receiver Gerald Jones as well. See th those are throws that that a quarterback in the SEC has to make. He just has to complete it. That's second down and third down open receivers and he threw it behind them in both cases. I mean that you just have to make those throws. So Cunningham's got to punt it again. Really got the hold of one tonight. This one could be returnable. No nope, fair catch taken by Pierre Lewis. And Auburn will have it back on offense with a six point lead as we check in with Aaron. And Brad, you know, we talked to Lane Kiffin quite a bit about Jonathan Crompton. He told us his attitude has been great, but these coaches have really been trying to stress when the ball is snapped, you need to perform at a higher level. What that means, your number one job is to deliver the ball to the playmakers. Todd, you mentioned it. Those are throws quarterbacks in the SEC should be making. You know, we heard from his coaching staff. Sometimes he tries to do a good job, you know, not listen to the community, hear all these volunteer fans. Does, doesn't internalize it, but we saw him versus UCLA. He got down on himself yeah. on that sideline. Yes, he did. You're exactly right. And I, don't, I don't like his body language right now either. I don't think it's a real positive thing. Ben Tate wrapped up. No gain. Chris Walker made the stop defensively in our first quarter. Uh, a beautiful night in Knoxville has come to a close. Tennessee struggling on offense. Auburn's high-powered offense hasn't produced much either, but they do lead 6-0. Tonight you're going to howl at the moon. It's a full moon for Smokey. You'll be there. You go. He got it right. He's still looking for some offense, though. What a day! The wind was kind of strong earlier. It's died down this evening. Perfect night for football. Perfect night for the festivities that began early in the morning for most. Start of the second quarter. Brad Nessler, Todd Blackledge, Aaron Andrews, and our ESPN crew. With Auburn's high-powered offense only having six points so far. They fake it to McCaleb. He wanted to go back to him and now throws to a wide open. Jay Wisner, the tight end. Pick up a 16. Nice patience that time by Chris Todd. He had good protection. And he was able to kind of scan the field and wait until he saw somebody open up down in there. Jay Wisner. Chris Todd just looks so much different than he looked last year oh, I guess. playing for Auburn. That shoulder was really a problem last year. Here's the quick throw out to Fannin. And Fannin can do a variety of things. Full back, tailback. On the swing pass there, knocked out of bounds by Savion Frazier, who's the guy playing middle linebacker for Tennessee, as Aaron talked about with Nick Revez, the captain, and kind of the heart and soul of their defense out. This guy, he's had to learn that middle linebacker position in a hurry. There's Nick. Boy, you, you don't hear too much praise from a guy like Monty Kiffin and Lane Kiffin and everybody else about one player that they talked about Nick being out with the injury. There's a nice hit out in the flat. I would think that would be yeah. Eric Berry. That is because it's Eric Berry. When, when you see somebody hit and that person doesn't move forward, <laughs> it's usually number 14. I mean, you know, some guys are just great tacklers. Eric Berry is a great tackler. When he tackles somebody, they go down. I mean, you just don't see him miss many tackles. He's got fine news boat over there with that sign. <laughs> There's another third and long for Auburn. They, they have not been in their comfort zone on third down in the game tonight only one of five and most of them like this pressure on Todd as he let go to Tate but they're going to bring him down again and a nice stop by Frazier the aforementioned middle linebacker so the punting unit comes out again 
Rivez can only be a cheerleader on those crutches, but he's been to practice and he has been basically helping coach all week long. Well, between him coaching on crutches and Eric Berry being Frazier's roommate, they're trying to get him coached up the best they can. That's exactly right. This kick takes off. Richardson's got to let it go. Will it make the end zone? Yes, it will. 13-03 remaining. 52-yard kick. When we return, Jonathan Crompton gets another crack from the 20-yard line. Tennessee offensively has one first down. That was on the first snap of the game in the Wildcat. New Keith Richardson going 41 yards. Jim Chaney, the offensive coordinator, looking on. He talked with us about Jonathan Crompton as well, and he said, you know, everybody's yelling, how, how about Nick Stevens? He said, well, no offense to Nick, but if we had Nick Stevens in there, the crowd might be wanting Jonathan yeah. Crompton. Yeah, the backup quarterback who doesn't play is always the most popular guy uh, exactly. to the crowd. Trying to establish a ground game. Maybe this will do it. Hardesty almost broke it. Monterio goes for 21 before Darren Bates can slow him down. Well, they run to the left side. That's where their strength is. Their starting left tackle, Chris Scott, is their best guy up front. Gets a great block right there at the point of attack. And Hardesty got right into his hip pocket and followed him down the field. Nice block by the guard, Corey Sullins, number 69 as well. And that's what Tennessee needs to do. That puts Hardesty over 500 yards on the ground already this year. For a guy whose best year was three years ago when he had 384. And might be a little bit winded over there, but leading the SEC in rushing after four games. He looks more than winded to me. I mean, I, I don't know what it is, but that looks more than just being winded. We mentioned his shoulder was a problem last week and the knee as well. But he's given them a spark here. Let's see if they can keep it going with Bryce Brown. Brown's going to be short of the first down as we check in with Reese Davis. Reese. All right, Brad, time for Sports Center right now. A couple of college football games went right down to the wire under a minute to go. LSU was down to Georgia by one. Charles Scott hasn't had a big year at a big moment. 33-yard touchdown. LSU won it 20 to 13. Took overtime and a lot of goal line stands, but Notre Dame outlasts Washington 37-30. Clawson for 422. Sports Center after the game. Stay current with ESPN News College Football Final later. Jimmy Clawson's had quite a year. Here's the give and going nowhere is Hardesty who came back in. No gain on the play. Nick Fairley made the tackle. So fourth down for Tennessee. Fourth down at about three. Teddy Grand, the running back coach here at Tennessee now. He was with Tommy Tuberville for 11 years at Auburn. And so uh, this game obviously very special for him. He's got a lot of friends and, and great relationships back in Auburn. But he's a uh, 100% volunteer right now. A little different shade of orange. Yeah, a little different shade of orange. From behind Cunningham to punt. Fair catch taken back at about the 14-yard line by Pierre Lewis. So, Tennessee still not on the board, but they've held Auburn pretty much in check. 6-0 Tigers. Under 103,000 at Neyland Stadium in Knoxville tonight. 102-941. Their team hasn't scored yet, though. Looking for an SEC win. Looking for a big play from their defense, maybe, as Auburn's got to line up at its own 13-yard line. Comes a blitz. Option. Pitch to McCaleb. And he got the corner before Barry. Whoa! Drills him out of bounds and takes one of the guys holding the sticks with him. That's the SEC on ESPN. You got that nice, <laughs> you got that nice jersey you can wear over there. You get your hat knocked off. As an All-American knocks a freshman out of bounds right here. Oh, Eric Berry makes a nice open field tackle. This was a great play call because they ran the option away from a corner blitz from the other side. So Tennessee was a little undermanned on that side of the field, but Berry made up for it. Inside handoff for Caleb again, and he's got the first down. Well, Caleb, I mentioned coming in with... 365 yards coming into the game. He's the first freshman 
in Auburn history to rush for more than 100 yards in the first two games of the season. And when you think about yeah. all the great backs Auburn's had, that's, uh, that's pretty impressive. First down, Todd play action. Wanted to go deep. Now Tennessee's got him, and he short arms one as Dan Williams is draped all over him. Dan Williams has had a nice ball game so far tonight. He's gotten some pressure on Chris Todd from his defensive tackle position. Good quickness off the football. And this is what you have to do. You've got to change the line of scrimmage and disrupt the timing and the rhythm and the flow of this Auburn offense. When you've had shoulder surgery in the offseason, you don't want a 325-pounder draped all over you while you're trying to throw. Taylor in the open field. Cut down at the 45, or he might have taken it all the way. As it is, he got 22 yards. There was some question whether Michaela would even be able to play full speed tonight. Had a little bit of an ankle injury. They let the rush in this time. That says screen, screen, screen. The lineman released downfield, and Michaela does a nice job of just running straight up the field. At the 46, now Cody Burns comes in in motion, but they give it on the handoff again to McKaylin. And he picked up a couple. Not by Harris, Mary. Now Auburn's pace a little bit faster than they were earlier in the game. Maybe getting a little more comfort level with this crowd, with the away game. And their fifth straight night game. That's never happened in Auburn history either. Cody Burns in there, wide receiver up to the top of your screen. Todd pressured again. Got away. Through to the middle of the field and completed it to Eric Smith. And you talk about the presence of Chris Todd on that yeah. play. He's lucky he even got in the back pedal back into the pocket. Well, Wes Brown had great pressure. It looked like it was going to be a sack potentially. And watch not only Chris Brown, but watch Eric Smith come back to the football. He just kept moving back towards his quarterback away from the defense to make the catch. That's Tate. Broke one tackle in the backfield. Tate with a blocker in front. Got a nice block from his wideout and got it to the 20-yard line. Darwin Adams down there, number 89, led the way for number 44. And you see a little sign of fatigue on this Tennessee defense. Some guys slow getting up off the ground. Here's the block by Adams on Rogan. At the end of this play, a couple Tennessee defenders kind of slow getting off the ground. This time, whistle stops play with 8.32 yeah. remaining. Tennessee called timeout. I, I think Monty Kiffin realized his Tennessee defense was gassed. That's their first charge timeout this half. And it's a fired up Auburn sideline because they finally feel like they've got something working. And look at everybody out there jumping around, including their head coach, Aaron. Brad, Gus Malzahn, one of his two key things with this hurry up offense, speeding up the game and mentally and physically wearing down your opponent. Todd mentioning the balls look tired. You know, Malzahn had said if we are going to have any chance against this talented team on the road, hostile crowd, those are two things we have to master. You know, you take away just a couple of plays by Tennessee. Hardesty had a nice run to Keith Richards in the first play of the ball game. It seems like Tennessee's defense has been out there the whole time. Yep. yep. And, and up until this drive had done an excellent job of negating big plays, you know, stopping them to short games, getting them into third down and long situations. They've moved this ball all the way down the field. I don't even know if they've had a third down situation. They've, they've made plays on first and second down, and they've eaten up chunks of yardage. And they had to start at their 13-yard line, and they worked it all the way down to the 21. In the first quarter, Auburn had one play of 20 yards or more. They've had two in this drive. Smith and Tate both in there with Todd. It'll be Tate straight up the gut. Looks like he's got another first down at the 10-yard line. And boy, when things start working, those linemen come off the their stance and their line a little bit quicker. The tailbacks are a little bit faster to hit the hole, and that's what's working right now for Auburn. And another timeout taken to measure. The officials, as Lane Kiffin looking down at his charts, and he is hoping his defense can somehow force another field goal attempt. I thought he got the first down, but they marked him back farther than I thought, 
And it is that close. Inches. Time right now to check in this week with our trivia question. Which school has the most wins at their home stadium? Most wins, home stadium. You got to figure the stadiums have to be kind of old, usually. <laughs> Either that or you win a whole bunch of games at home. Think it over. We'll tell you later. Second down and inches. Tate straight up the middle, touchdown. Eleven yards for Ben Tate, who lost his lid but scored the six. That looked too easy right there. Yeah. Well, some nice blocking up front. The center, Ryan Pugh gets a block, and Mike Berry, number 66, leads up in there. They block back. The guard pulls around through, gets a piece of two of them, and Tate right into the end zone. Byram with the point after. The kick is up and good with eight minutes and change remaining now. Auburn 13, Tennessee nothing. Tate tasting the end zone. When we come back, Todd will help taste the town. And, Mom, that looks fried to me, I'm telling you. Going to the game this weekend, Jim? Well, Jerry, for more on that, let's throw it over to the Hampton Hotel where my wife Tracy has checked in. Trace, what's the mood over there? In a word, Jim, electric. Comfy beds, complimentary hot breakfast, and friendly service. Now, Trace, well, what's that noise I hear? Wow, I wish you listened this well at home, Jim. She's kidding. <laughs> I'm not. It's college football, honey. Well, there you have it, folks. And Trace, I'll see you in a few hours. Back to you, Jerry. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Introducing Arby's new $5 and one cent combos. Five delicious full-size sandwiches with curly fries and a drink, all for only $5.01. But why the extra penny? It's for our world-famous roast beef, slow oven roasted to perfection every day and freshly sliced to order. It's for our signature French dip and Swiss with hot, savory au jus. And it's for the unique taste that only Arby's can deliver with our new classic roast beef patty mount. So say hello to Arby's new $5.01 combos. Worth every penny and here to stay. ESPN Monday Night Football, Packers Vikings at 8.30. When Charles Chandler retired from the K-25 nuclear plant back in 2000, he and his wife Gwen wanted to start a business that they and their two daughters could be a part of. So they found an open building and started a restaurant serving home-style cooking and secret family recipes to a wide range of clientele here in the Knoxville area. Now the chicken here at Chandler's is outstanding, both the fried and the rotisserie, of course I had to have some of both. Add to that some side dishes of macaroni and cheese, green beans, broccoli and cheese casserole, and a piece of cornbread, and I am good to go. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. <laughs> now wait a minute, this yeah. is the first time I've gone with you. You ate the entire, yeah. what you well, had there. Everything except I didn't eat all the cornbread. But the reason oh. I didn't eat all the cornbread is because <laughs> Charles wanted me to try his ribs, too. So oh, he yeah. brought a couple ribs out. But, yeah, everything else on there except about half the cornbread I didn't eat. Oh, but boy, I replaced that's, that's, that with a rib. That's too bad. So the ribs <laughs> were as good as the chicken, and you had to have two kinds of chicken. I, I had to have both kinds of chicken because they were both outstanding. And so. I was complaining that you didn't have a little <laughs> picnic basket back here. I about wish half time yeah. is what we need right now. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, we need some uh, we need some chicken chicken winter uh, dinner, and we need Tennessee to have some offense somehow. If you want to win a hundred dollar gift certificate to Chandler's, log on to ESPN.com, search Taste of the Town, and tell us why you deserve to win. And you could be going over there eating some of that mac and cheese, broccoli casserole, two oh. times of chicken. Good stuff. And the ribs. Good stuff. Did you wash that down with sweet tea? As okay, that, that was a dumb question. Yeah. Sorry. Until the container was empty. 87-yard <laughs> touchdown drive by Auburn. Then take capped it off from 11 yards. Lukeis Richardson, who really has one of the only big plays of the night for Tennessee. Pretty close to having another one. Nice return again to the 36-yard line. 30-yard return. Earlier, we asked you the trivia question for tonight, and it was, which school has the most wins at their home stadium? You thought Tennessee, maybe, because we're here? You're close. Georgia Tech, Bobby Dodd Stadium, and Grant Field. That baby's been around since 1912 or 13, though. That, that helps. 432. Neyland Stadium in Knoxville with 424. 
And this place opened up as Shield Watkins Field in 1921. And now 102,941 on a spectacular October nights watching Auburn leading 13 to nothing. Jonathan Crompton got a nice block. Can he get two? He throws as he's going down. And he threw it to the Auburn sideline. El Toro Freeman was giving him some pressure. And Jonathan, who had a five touchdown game against Western Kentucky in the opener, that has been the bright spot of his season so far. That was really a good defensive call by Ted Roof. He actually had two guys coming to, to the quarterback's side and only one blocker. And Freeman is the guy who got free. Second down and two. Here's a toss to Hardesty. Ontario got the corner, and he got chopped down, but he got a first down. Boy, some nice blocking on the edge. Chris Scott, number 79, with a huge block as he pulled out to lead this play. Watch big number 79 get out there. Nice block by the tight end, Stalker, and then Chris Scott just absorbs that whole side and enables Hardesty to get up the sideline. He got up the sideline in a hurry. 43 yards on six carries for Ontario on a first down at the 48. Even though Crompton has not looked good, they still have to try to throw play action and take a shot down the field, I think, on first down. Hardesty spinning, and he's going to lose a yard here. I think we'll get another update on USC. Let's check in with Reese. All right, Brad, and USC is late. Bears were getting too much love a couple weeks ago from everybody. Now they're getting pushed around. Tennessee second down and 11. Compton fires. Oh, and you got to make that catch. Finally, he delivers one on the money, and Quentin Hancock might have had a weird angle looking back for that ball, but it pretty much hit him either in the hands or in the 8 7. Wow. Yeah, I don't get that one. That was a beautiful throw. That's what I thought. A beautiful throw. It would have been a first down. He took the hit anyway. And instead, it's it's third down and 12 for Tennessee. Hancock has been pretty reliable. Yeah. From the 46, Tennessee trying to get something to work. Quick slant. <laughs> that would just ricochet off Hancock. Uh, that tells the story right there. The look on Lane Kiffin's face. Well, and somebody came free too on the protection. Watch Crompton. He has to throw it because somebody gets right in. You know what? The linemen were releasing downfield like it was supposed to be a screen, and Quentin Hancock looked like the ball was definitely not supposed to come to him. So I'm not sure what that play was. That hit him right in the yeah. side of the helmet. If yeah. nothing else, it's a wake-up call for Hancock. You get ear hole on a pass going about 90 miles an hour. Nice coverage. How about, Eric Berry? Yeah. How about Eric Berry? The leading tackler on the team and also the leading tackler on the special teams. He does, he does it does all. It. He does. Put him in on offense. <laughs> they might need to. <laughs> Wildcat. Knoxville, Auburn, and Tennessee. And it's all Auburn so far. Tennessee unable to get their offense in gear. The defense has been on the field a lot. And they're back out there right now. And this is almost the spot where Auburn started their uh, touchdown drive the last time they had it. They started at the 13. Right now it's at the 12. Last time they went 87 yards in nine plays and took only two and a half minutes to do it. Capping it off with Tate. Then Tate's touchdown run, his second of the year. Cody Burns in. In the Wildcats. And he's going to run it. Cody. Got a nice block. Got out to about the 18-yard line before he's plowed out of bounds. And let's check in with Reese. All right, Brandon, a couple of Miami turnovers. A shaky start against Oklahoma. Had them down 10-0, but Ja'Cory Harris marched his team back down. Big run by Javaris James. And then finds Jimmy Graham, who had a couple of costly drops against Virginia Tech. And the former basketball player slam dunks one. It's 10-7. And here it's Auburn keeping it on the ground with Ben Tate. That's going to bring up third down. Third and about three. Just under six minutes remaining in the first half. Ben Tate. 
I mentioned came in as the number three rusher in the conference. Tennessee is going to bring an extra man as Todd is flushed and throws across the middle, and he somehow got it to his wideout, Darvin Adams, again. And this is a quarterback that's playing with some confidence because this is not a, a real <laughs> – this is a risky play. Let me right. put it that way. Yep. I mean, he was flushed. He really didn't have a receiver on that side. He was under duress, and he kind of hung it out there. But Adams got to bail him out. Threw one to Eric Smith on that last drive yep. in a similar situation. Now he's got another first down to work with. High snap. He gets it to Tate, though. Tate made one man miss. Actually got to the edge before he's run down. Pick up of about three. Now we mentioned that we don't you don't see Eric Berry miss many tackles. Well, he misses this one. He gets out there, he keeps him outside, and he went for the legs. Instead of maintaining leverage and forcing him back inside, he went for the legs and the tackle and missed. Give Ben Tate a little credit for the left hand stiff arm too on Eric's noggin. That helped him get out, pick up positive yardage. Here's Cody Burns in motion. Todd hit as he throws, and he got it complete to Smith again, and it's another first down. So Eric Smith, who's played a little fullback, a little tailback, has two big catches in this quarter out of the backfield. Boy, again, under duress. I mean, this is a heck of a throw by Chris Todd. I don't even know how he got it away. I mean, he, Rogan is right in there on the blitz, and Chris Todd gets rid of it the last second, and accurately as well. At the 43, first down, up back to Tate they go. And Tate's going to be wrapped up by Dan Williams. But he's still got five yards, and they've still got plenty of time to work with. When you can score and go 87 yards in two and a half minutes, yeah. you don't have to worry when there's only 420 left and you got two timeouts left. We'll take a look. Sky came behind Chris Todd. Playing with a lot of confidence, as Todd said. Tate's. Close to another first down. Now, and even if they don't get it, back-to-back -back third downs now have been third and short. And that, that's the rhythm, that's the comfort level for this offense. They had the nice scoring drive the last time they had the football. And now here they are moving it again. This is what Todd is talking about. A high percentage, almost 69% when they've got it in this short situation, which they have now, third down and one. And Todd's going to do it himself. Chris Todd with a quarterback sneak. And we talked about Chris Todd and his shoulder. Last year, he knew he had a messed up shoulder. He decided to try to play through it and just rehab and, and just try to deal with it. And uh, he didn't have a very productive year. I mean, the whole offense struggled. They, they fired their offensive coordinator, Tony Franklin, after three or four ball games. They, a, a, a difficult year offensively. He had it surgically repaired. This offseason missed a lot of spring ball because of that, but he looks so much different. Does he ever? Tate cut it outside. Ben Tate, oh, very, very again got knocked down and Tate stayed up. There was a major collision between 44 and 14, and 44 won it again. Yep. And ben Tate is running hard. I mean, we, we knew coming into the game, hardesty for Tennessee, a physical runner, but Ben Tate is running with some physicality as well. First and 10 for Auburn with a 13 point lead. And a 302 remaining. Time out. Tennessee. Now, this is another That's fatigue timeout for time Tennessee. I mean they are they are on their heels here at the end of the second quarter. Who are you? A researcher producing energy from switchgrass, a supercomputer wizard solving climate change, or a teacher inspiring generations of young minds. At the University of Tennessee, we've graduated over 300,000 of these very special people who are changing the future every day. Because all great accomplishments start with someone special. Imagine a better future, then do something about it. You think this isn't going to be fun on Monday night after all those years of wearing the green and gold of Green Bay? It's Brent Favre in a Viking uniform, of all things. 
The Vikings try to stay undefeated. The Packers are visiting the Metrodome. 8.30 Monday night on ESPN. It all starts at 7 o'clock as Applebee's kicks things off for you. Now, that looks still funny to me. Yeah. As I grew up a Viking fan, I didn't think I'd ever see Brett Favre. But what about it? Jim Brown played for the Steelers back in the day. That, that didn't look right. How about Derek Jeter in a Red Sox mm. uniform? That ain't going to work. Keep going. Peyton as a Gator? I don't think so. Oh, this one's the worst. Oh, boy. Bear Bryant yeah. coaching Auburn. I don't think so. Anyway, Monday night, Brett Favre tries to keep the Vikings undefeated. That's going to be a lot of fun in Minneapolis. Tenth play of the drive here for Auburn. They're trying to have some more fun before halftime. They lead 13 to nothing. Blitz comes up the middle. And cutting it outside and stumbling is Michaela. He still got five yards, and Eric Berry made the tackle. But well, when I watch this offense, I mean, the thing that stands out to me, first of all, is the efficiency of Chris Todd and the confidence and the composure he's playing with. But then it's just the, you know, they, they keep you guessing. I mean, they run inside, they run outside, they throw quick, they throw down the field. And, and it's all, you know, the, the play calling and the quarterback operating this offense, but they really keep you on their heels as a defense because they do so many different things. Almost to the red zone after starting at their own 12-yard line again. Their scoring drive last time started at the 13. They're hoping for more, and Todd going to the end zone. Incomplete intended for Darwin Adams. We go to Reese Davis quickly. All right, Brad, coming up on the Wendy's Halftime Report, the Sooners in Miami in a battle in South Florida. We'll show you the LSU-Georgia game and how a little bit of a controversial call might have aided LSU. And Claus's cardiac kids do it again. Mark and Dr. Lou are here. We'll see you in just a few seconds coming up on Wendy's Halftime Report. You got it, Reese. We'll see you in 2 11. Chris Todd. Third down at five. It's a huge play for Tennessee right here. And sure they've is. got to get a stop on this third down play. They're asking their crowd for help again. Todd, option, late pitch, loose ball. McCaleb's got to cover it. Back at the 30-yard line. That's even better than they could have yeah. hoped for. Well, that, that's the first mistake I've seen Chris Todd make. I mean, you know, the I, I ran a little bit of option, very little. And the old saying was, when in doubt, don't pitch it out. Well, he was, there was some doubt with Chris Todd what he should do, and that late pitch was a bad pitch, and McCaleb did the right thing of covering it up. Wes Byram's already made a couple from 29 and 43. He's definitely capable from this distance. 47-yard field goal attempt, and he missed it. So there's what Tennessee needed. They got the stop that Todd was just talking about a minute ago. But now, so they got that. But now, if you're Lane Kiffin, do you try to score? I mean, your quarterback and your passing game has looked anemic to this point. You've had a few runs, but then when it's come time to have to throw the football, you haven't done anything. So now with a minute 30 and one timeout, do you come out and play aggressively in a two-minute style offense? Or do you just try to go into halftime and try to make some corrections? I don't throw it to Quentin Hancock if ah. I'm Jonathan Crompton right now. After hitting him in the hands and in the head the last two times he threw the ball. Three receivers to the near side and one motions back. Crompton steps up, goes across the middle, tipped and incomplete intended this time for Denarius Moore. Brad, you mentioned not throwing it to Hancock. When I was over on the sidelines after those two drops, things not good with the wide receivers and their coach, Frank Wilson, giving it to them. Brandon Warren actually had to be separated from the group because he was going off on Coach Wilson, some of his players. So not a lot of guys over there getting along, being on the same page, if you will. And Warren's over there on the sideline because of that, I'm sure. So that was, 26 remaining. And that was another crossing route where the ball was behind the receiver. You can't you can't make catches that way. Dropped him again. This time he got the crossing route to Gerald Jones, and Jones got the first down and laid a lick on the corner. Nico Thorpe before he went out of bounds. See, Jonathan has had guys open on crossing routes, but that's the first time that he's put the ball out in front of the receiver where he can catch it and keep running. Part of this applause from the partisan Tennessee crowd is because Tennessee's got a first down and still a chance, and part of it's a little bit of a mockery yeah. of finally completing a pass, I think. 
That's my opinion anyway. At the 43-yard line, still hope for Tennessee. Even if they got a field goal for halftime, they'd be lucky and happy. I'm sure Rooks, ball tipped in the air, knocked down by Mike Blank. A big defensive tackle. So the clock stops with 115. Tennessee, as you see, has one timeout remaining. Wide receivers in there, Moore and Jones. The tight end hasn't been used yet, Luke Stocker. I think Gerald Jones is the guy that's got to make a play for Tennessee, number four. He's, he's the main guy for them. Right in the hands of the receiver that time, Denarius Moore. And he dropped it. McFadden, who was shaken up earlier, is the guy out there in the corner that made the play. Okay, now this is not the quarterback's fault. Nope. You, you can't do it any better than that. Here comes the ball. Catch it. Don't worry about running it later. You're going to get blasted from behind anyway. Just get your hands on it and get down. And Gerald Jones is in the slot right here. This, this is, I think, the guy that can make a play for Tennessee. Pump fake. And now it is the tight end. Stocker down the middle. All the way down to the 18-yard line. Really a nice route by Stalker. He faked the out and then turned back to the post. Stalker's right here. He's going to go out and then back to the post. And Crompton timed it out perfectly and delivered the ball in front of the receiver. Now trying to take advantage of that play. Hardesty still on his feet. First and goal, Tennessee. Lots of time for Tennessee. The clock will stop as they reset the chains for first down, and they also have one timeout. How big could this be before heading to the locker room if the Vols can pound it in here? As big as this stadium is. That's right. That's how big. And it's big. Well, I think you go right back to Montario Hardesty right here. So do I. And if you don't get in, you call timeout. Hardesty. Toward the end zone. Did he get there? Yes, he did. Montario Hardesty. The heart and soul of the ground game is fifth rushing touchdown of the year. Caps a major drive in the waning moments of the second quarter here in Knoxville. Point after, up and blocked. Look out. Scooped up by Auburn. Well, that's the only bad part of what we just saw in the last couple of minutes. A blocked extra point. Pretty nice play that time by Bram Cannon, the uh, the holder. Kind of reached up an arm and stopped Herring from taking that for two points the other way. Nonetheless, what looked like maybe a 16 or worse score going to the yeah. locker room for Auburn after they That's missed right. the field goal, 70 yards and seven plays and a touchdown. They'll take it. Do some push-ups, guys. Yes. And the good thing for Tennessee, Jonathan Crompton hit a couple big passes in that drive. He hit Gerald Jones on the crossing route on third down and the beautiful throw to his tight end stalker to get him down inside the 15 yard line. So that'll give some confidence to not only the quarterback, but the rest of that beleaguered Tennessee offense. Ben Tate's going to drop back with Mario Fannin for Auburn. Chad Cunningham to kick off. Tate's got a touchdown tonight, and Hardesty has a touchdown tonight. The two veteran tailbacks. Line drive kick. Scooped up by Smith. Smith the up man. He knows what to do with it, though. You better watch out. 
gets out close to the 39 yard line. So Auburn's got two timeouts left yep. in 21 seconds. And they've got a good field goal kicker, though he missed his last one. His career long is 49, so they have to get it down around the 32 yard line, maybe. The only thing I would say, if if, if Gus Malzahn is going to go for it here and try to get another field goal or better, then he ought to tell his quarterback, Chris Todd, to not throw too often in the area of number 14. Derek Berry can snatch it and take off the other way in a hurry. Todd fires. Diving attempt incomplete. Intended for Fannin. Now we're down to 17 seconds. Second down and 10 for the Tigers. Up by a touchdown. Oh, they tried to wrap it around to McCaleb, and they almost fumbled the oh. football. That's the way they run the draw. It's kind of a, a funky way of doing it. The quarterback actually goes past the running back and then wraps it back around and hands it to him in front. And lucky they didn't drop the football. Tennessee with a touchdown late in the second quarter, and there's hope in Neyland Stadium. As they head to the locker room now, only down by seven, having had the extra point blocked. But, boy, a big difference. As we said, Auburn was driving. Looked like it would be an egg on the board for Tennessee at halftime, and it's not with that late touchdown. Let's check in with Aaron. Well, Coach, I'll start with your defense first. Able to shut these guys out until that last scoring drive. What did their offense figure out? Well, you know, they hit us with a great third down call on the double move and a young safety back there. We bit on it. Big play for them. We've been playing well all night right now. We just can't give up the big plays, and we got to we got to make stops so we're not in the hole with field position right now. Offensively, I know that's not what Chris Todd wanted, but you guys seem to have picked it up a bit. What's been the difference? Well, you know, offensively right now, we're doing some nice things to move the football. We're tempoing them a little bit. We had a chance to kind of close the door on them down here, and we didn't come up with any points, so that hurts. All right, Coach, thank you. Thank you. All right, well, Brad. Gene Chizik's got two more quarters to try to stay undefeated with his second SEC win. Lane Kiffin looking for his first. 13-6 at halftime as we send it to the studio. Reese Davis. <laughs> Hampton Hotels just about set to start the third. An important touchdown for the Volunteers right before the break to make it 13 to 6 as we're set to set into the heck uh, into the second half and our city first half beg your pardon to chase first half statistics look like this rushing yardage relatively even both Tate and uh, Hardesty had great first halves total yardage Auburn's actually on their pace yep. to come up with as many yards as they normally get they're just doing it in a different way I think so far and they'll have an opportunity to do it first in the third quarter. As Tennessee will kick away and Tate, who has the touchdown tonight for Auburn back deep. Cunningham's kick goes down to the five yard line to Tate. And Ben's got a little bit of room to work. Puts a stiff arm out there, stays inbounds. And a nice return. He might not be necessarily as speedy as some return guys. When he gets his hands on the football, he knows what to do with it. And as we welcome you back, Brad Nessler, Todd Blackley, Jaron will join us in a minute. Tate had almost 100 yards in the first half, and he was really the bell cow for Auburn. He really was. I mean, and he, he did it both ways. He ran outside. He ran inside. You know, he, we, we talk about his speed. Maybe he isn't a burner, but I think he's faster than he looks. Right. I think his speed is kind of deceptive. And uh, you mentioned Auburn on pace to hit their yardage mark. But they haven't had the big explosive plays. Only two plays of 20 yards or more in that first half. So Tennessee's defense doing what they had to do in terms of limiting those big plays. At some point, you just think that Chris Todd, who's been so efficient and came in with 11 touchdown passes, is going to rip one to somebody for a big gainer. Here he is with good field position to work. Gives it off to McCaleb, the freshman. And Dennis Rogan only uh, gave him about a yard before he made the stop. 
Tennessee's defense did a nice job. They looked like they were going to bend and bend and bend, and they had to call a couple of timeouts just to get their wind. And I yeah. think Monty Kiffin did a nice job in both those cases of giving his guys just a little bit of time to regroup. In one case, it led to a field goal. In another case, it led to a missed field goal. Here's a swing pass out to Fannin. Fannin spinning, and there's a whole bunch of orange jerseys around as he picked up about five. Rico McCoy was the first guy to meet him. Number five, the senior out of Washington, D.C. Rico, <laughs> what a fun guy to be around. All of us were talking with him the other day. He said to us, you know what? They're not giving me credit for enough tackles. I don't know who's keeping count on these things. I've had eight the last two weeks. I said, it seems more like you've had 12. He said, I think that's close. That's closer. Out of Washington, D.C., but a Dallas Cowboy fan, of all things. Todd is hit as he throws. Ball is up. And it fell to the earth before Eric Berry could get to it. Chris Walker. I'll tell you, Todd's taking some shots. Trying to throw the football. Yep. That can't be great on your arm. Nope. Walker's going to come from the outside on the left. He beats their best offensive lineman, Lee Zimba, their best tackle, and gets a hand on the shoulder and affects the pass. And Tennessee forces a three and out their first defensive possession. Well, you can't ask for anything better in the first minute and a half of the game than that. And Durst will have to punch. Nice kick. Richardson's got a call for the fair catch and takes it right at the 10 yard line as we go down to Aaron Andrews. Brad, I got a chance to meet up with Lane Kiffin coming out of the locker room. I asked him, what was the difference for your offense in that scoring drive? He said, up tempo, we got it together, but more importantly, Jonathan Crompton settled down. I asked him, what has to happen early for his offense here? He said, anything. We just cannot play as bad as we did in that first half. He says, you have your defense playing as well as they can. You're out there all night long, and your offense can't do anything. Hey, Todd has the taste of the town. I have the wardrobe update. Lane Kiffin changed from the black sweatshirt he told me at first temperature wise but then I said it's superstition isn't it and he said yeah it is yeah, it didn't work so good well I don't know he might want to he might want to go back to maybe he wants to just take the windbreaker off completely because Crompton trying to get back to hand the ball off and there was Lane in the first half easier to spot yeah and there he is in the second half, and he's going, oh, man. I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I prefer the black. Yeah, well. I mean, I like the color orange, but I <laughs> I like the black better. Todd, worry about your fried chicken and your rotisserie and your broccoli casserole. I got your wardrobe yeah, update. Yeah. I like the black, too. <laughs> okay, good. Crompton from his own goal line. Throw that pass into the end zone, actually, to Bryce Brown, who brought it out to the 10, a pickup of about three. Well, here's a here's a critical situation now right away for Jonathan Crompton first possession of the third quarter. It's third and long deep in his own territory. Danger zone danger zone is right. Your, your team is in the game. Be smart with the football. Your first job is to take care of the football. On third and 11. Yes, he did. They wanted to throw, I guess, a middle screen, and he just threw that baby in the dirt because Jake Ricks had him in his sights. Well, I think Auburn was anticipating screen as well. I mean, normally when you run a screen, you let the lineman come through, but not only did they let him come through, Bryce Brown was covered, the intended receiver. Tennessee's fourth three and out, and it puts Cunningham in the end zone to punt. Auburn should get great field position yep. out of this. Really able to flip the field. Nice kick, though. Here, Lewis is going to go all the way back to the 38 yard line. And got it back to the 44. Still, that's going to be a great place to start for Chris Todd and the Auburn offense. Can they get it in gear? Auburn in front, the SEC on ESPN, leading 13 to 6. Well, if you're living in the Dallas area, let's say the Cowboys are your favorite team. They probably are, or maybe the Texas Longhorns. ESPNDallas.com gives you all the local coverage. Cowboys and the Longhorns and all the rest. ESPNDallas.com serving the sports fans the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Coming soon, ESPN.com for New York and L.A. Check it out. The Hogs and AM are playing in Arlington tonight, yeah, aren't they? They sure are. 
Hogs winning pretty good, I think. Ryan Mallett's having a big night. Cody Burns. Well, he got it out to about the 48-yard line. Picked up four. Savvy and Frazier, the middle linebacker, made the stop. You know, he's done a nice job for a guy that's had to yep. learn quickly and hadn't played middle linebackers Aaron said since sixth grade. Uh, he's filling in pretty well for Nick Gravez. Rico McCoy told him, he said, hey, look, if you make a mistake, just make it full speed because <laughs> yeah. I'm running right behind you. <laughs> Here's a end around. Tate pitches it to Fannin and Fannin. Still on his feet, all the way to the 20-yard line. Boy, that one kind of looked like it was going to be a disaster, and it worked out perfectly. See, this offense fakes a reverse all the time. I mean, they always have a guy coming in motion that looks like he could run the reverse, but then they sneak one in on you and get that misdirection going, and it fooled the Tennessee defense. The reason I thought it was going to be a disaster, the pitch was kind of high, and that could have been a loose ball. Now it's Tate going on his own, Ben Tate. Down to the six yard line, maybe the five. It's first and goal, Auburn. Rico McCoy tripped him up, or it would have been a touchdown. And again, Auburn lines up. You look behind him, Tate in there, over 100 yards on the ground now, including a touchdown. They'll stay with him, Dan Tate. Oh, the ball. Who's got it? I think the wide receiver yep. might have gotten on top of it. Boy, great effort, hustle effort by Darvin Adams. He was blocking downfield. He saw the ball loose and jumps back in after it. Watch him blocking. Here he is. He's blocking. He sees the ball pop out and dives in after it. What a heads-up play by the wide receiver. Let's put it this way. That's the best catch Darvin Adams has made all night. Cody Burns in for Auburn. In the Wildcats set, playing quarterback. He'll try to run it off the right side, and he almost lost the ball. They closed the gap on him as he got inside the two-yard line. This is an unbalanced line that they use when they run Burns in the Wildcat, which means they have a guard and a tight end on the left of the formation and a guard in both tackles to the right of the formation. And Cody Burns tried to run that way. See, this is a tight end right here. And he got two tackles over here, and that's the way they want to run. But Tennessee was ready for it and defended it well. Cody Burns had three touchdowns rushing against Mississippi State. He's going to drop back to pass here. Now scrambling for his life. Lobs it and incompletes. In and out of the hands of McCaleb. It was really a heads-up play by Cody Burns. It wasn't there initially. They thought they could fool him right away. Watch, he's going to sell the run, and then he wants to throw right now. Well, it's not there. So he buys time as quarterback training. Keeps his eyes downfield, and at the last minute, makes a beautiful throw to McCaleb, but the freshman not able to catch it. Ledge, I got to think this is a win right now for Tennessee's yeah, defense, too. Absolutely. Forcing another field goal. 19-yard attempt this time. West Byram kick on the way, and it's good. With just over nine and a half minutes remaining in the third quarter. Could have been a lot worse. Cody Burns on a near miss in the corner of the end zone. They have to settle for three. Brought to you by Chick-fil-A. We didn't invent the chicken, just the chicken sandwich. And the principal financial group will give you an edge. Lindsey Nelson Stadium. They had the uh, Orange White Inter Squad game there last night. One of the legendary broadcasters of all time, Eric Berry, on the sideline right now. His team down by 10, but it could have been a lot worse. Again, the defense of Tennessee held when they had to. Cody Burns came in, ran the, ran the Wildcat for a couple plays there. I don't know, Todd. You know, they're, they're moving it down the field. I know Ben Tate put one on the on the turf, but. They're kind of gashing Tennessee, yeah. and I thought they got a little bit cute with that Wildcat thing. Well, the Wildcat has been kind of their goal line offense, but Tennessee was ready for it. At the four-yard line. And tripped up at the 24. That's where Tennessee will go to work. Let's take a look at tonight's Good Hands flashback, brought to you by Allstate. Take you back December 97, the Georgia Dome, the SEC Championship. Auburn had a lead, but then a guy named Manning came back. The touchdown pass. 
And the balls were on their way back. But could they come all the way back? Peyton Manning again. This time, a 46 yard touchdown. A 73 yarder at the end and a 30 to 29 final for the Volunteers. Now yeah, there's some pretty good guys. Doug Atkins, Reggie White, Peyton Manning. Two in the Hall of Fame and one that will be. So first down at the 35. See if Tennessee can get their offense in gear. Big shift that brings Hardesty basically right back where you expect him to be. The tailback in the eye, and here he comes, and Auburn knew it. Gosh. Binds the middle linebacker made a shot. Hardesty has really not been able to break a big one tonight. After a 140-yard night last week. I got to believe Auburn is thinking, you know what? If The only way that we're going to get beat here is if we don't stop their run. So if that means we have to put extra bodies around the line of scrimmage, and then we need to do that. Two tight ends for Tennessee here. Hardesty trying to cut it outside. Auburn's not going to let him. And it's exactly what Todd was just talking about. Nico Thorpe was the first guy there to force it on the corner. A sophomore out of Tucker, Georgia. It's always nice when your last name's Thorpe and you're playing yeah. in the secondary. Absolutely. Yeah. An award named by that. But what Nico did there beautifully was keep leverage. You know, you tell your defenders to keep your outside arm free to force everything back inside. And Hardesty tried to set him up, and he just maintained that leverage and was able to force Hardesty for a, a very short game. Here's that third and long thing that Tennessee has not been good at. Crompton looking left. Now he's going to tuck it and take off on his own. He's not going to get there. A couple yards shy of the first down. And it'll be fourth. Tennessee will have to give it up again. It's the seven and a half minutes remaining in the third quarter. That's the tenth offensive possession for Tennessee, and half of them, five of those possessions, Auburn's defense didn't allow them to have a first down. So it has been another very difficult night for the Tennessee offense. I'm not sure if that means the Auburn defense is that good, or if the Tennessee offense just has some some problems, or maybe a combo of both. Yep. Punts again, fair catch called for and taken back near the 10 yard line with 6.52 remaining in the quarter. This is going to be fun on Monday night. Brett Favre did it last week in the last couple of seconds. Can he do it to his old team, the Green Bay Packers? Epic Monday night battle between those two teams. Brett Favre, he's got a little something in his bag from Auburn back in the day. Not only beat Alabama, but through Two touchdown passes for Southern Mississippi. The last one coming with 46 seconds to go in a 13 to 12 win. The legs are a lot older. The throwing motion, not much different. Not much different at all. <laughs> Drops that head and drives it. And now it's McCaleb who picks up about four. Let's check in with Aaron. Brad, you and Todd mentioning it, this Tennessee defense, they are gassed. Just watching them over on the sideline, free safety, Jansen Jackson cramping up, doing some stretching on the sidelines. They're handing out Pedialyte, Powerade to these guys like nobody's business. Eric Berry was watching the Jumbotron, trying to will the offense. Come on, come on, come on, get the first down. Give us a blow here. They're exhausted. You can see with the time of possession, Auburn's had a 10 extra minutes. That's the time that Tennessee's been out there trying to slow them down. Auburn's had 23 more snaps than the Volunteers, and that's a bunch in one game. Todd rolls and fires and in and out of the hands of Cody Burns, who made a diving attempt in front of the Tennessee bench. So third down and long for the Tigers. Now, this is not the Chris Todd that tied the school record with five touchdown passes like he did against Ball State last week, but he's been pretty efficient especially on some of those routes where he's had to scramble around and find yeah. somebody in the middle of the field. And he's done a pretty good job taking care of the football, too, not throwing it carelessly in the bad spots. 
And here's the draw play as they do wrap it around to McCaleb. And McCaleb's got a first down and a bunch more. Well, they dropped that play. They dropped the ball, I should say, the last time they ran that play. This time it works on a third and six for 12 yards. Tennessee thinking pass all the way. Wes Brown is going to rush the passer and kind of run right by McCaleb, number 94, right there. It was a nice call by Guest Malzahn, really fooled the Tennessee defense who was expecting pass. The linesman's a guy that stopped play here to have a word with the referee. And getting the clock wound. Now they got to go. First and ten. And Caleb again. And short gain on the play. Dan Williams made the stop. Let's check in with Reese Davis. Reese. The Sooners in the third. Boy, that'll take the taste of the loss out of their mouth, wouldn't it? They can win that one at home. That'd be huge, and that would be a big dent in Oklahoma's hopes. Two losses are not going to cut it in the BCS. McCaleb, big blocker out in front, but a nice job by Eric Berry to kind of blow that thing up. They had Mike Berry, all 311 pounds of him, pulling out there in front of McCaleb. And watch number 14 come up and make the play. Well, he comes from all the way on the other side of the field, too, but he takes the proper angle. You know, angles are so important in defensive football. It's not good enough just to have speed if you don't know how to take proper angles. Barry showed both on that play. Third and seven. Fannin in motion. Here comes a blitz right up the middle. Todd throws it away. That blitz was timely and effective. Monty Kiffin says that's the way we do it, fellas. Oh, Monty loves it. He loves it, forces a punt. It puts a good lick on the quarterback, and it makes number 12 think about it the next time. I mean, that was a good hit by Savion Frazier. Clinton Durst still have to punt it away. Keith Richardson has been waiting back there for one he could handle. Good no call. And he just lets it go. He thought about it about three times and decided not to pick it up. Well, that was dangerous, though, what he did. Yeah, he kind of hurdled he, it. He jumped over the football. <laughs> that catches his foot. That's another Tennessee turnover. That could have been a burning hedge underneath your rear end there if you have it touch you. All right, Reese, here it is, 16-6. Auburn has led throughout. Eric Berry on the sideline. Just a special player and a great young fellow to be around. Many hits as he's taken and given out tonight. That's what he was telling us yesterday about a little more time in treatment, a little more time getting the massage work done because he's a little sore making so many tackles as he has this year. Second down and 10 as the pass is incomplete by Crompton. Boy, coming into the game, Quentin Hancock was the leading receiver for Tennessee. But he and Jonathan Crompton just have not <laughs> been on the same page today. They just have not been able to get connected. He I was think, open. I think Crompton's been on the page. I think Hancock's not reading the writing. Second down and 10. Stocker, the tight end in motion. Hardesty spinning his way right into a group of Tigers. Boy, Auburn is showing good discipline on defense yeah. here. Just to, that was, we, we already saw Thorpe do it. Now that time it was McFadden on the corner, and his job is to stay outside and force everything inside. Hardesty was not able to turn the corner, and there were more white shirts coming from inside out to make the play. McFadden doesn't get the tackle, but he does his job. Now Bryce Brown is Hardesty over there getting a breather, kind of shaking his head after that last hit. And here it is, third down and long again. Tennessee's been living in third and eight. This time they might get it. Nope. Gerald Jones brought down. It's nice open be. field tackle. Wow. Yeah, that is. That's about a half a yard short. Jamon Washington made the hit. Uh, you know what? It, it looks like Lane Kiffin's going to go for it. Wow. A lot of time left in the football game. Down 10. 
but here's the deal. I mean, the best thing that your team does is run with Montario Hardesty. Better than throwing the ball on third down. And it's going to be Bryce Brown, though. Hardesty didn't come back out there. See if they can pick up a yard. Play action. Crompton throws to Stalker, and he's got it. Gutsy call. Wow. <laughs> Gutsy call. Gutsy call, a quarterback who's only completed a handful of throws tonight, but he makes the play when they need it, desperately. Fake the play action, hide the ball, get your head around, and deliver an accurate throw. And Tennessee lets their defense rest. One more series of downs. Stocker's been his best target, really. Two big plays, both first downs. That one huge on fourth. Now the toss to Hardesty. Got his fullback in front as he tries to get the corner. Kevin Cooper trying to get a block out there in front. Short gain for Ontario. We talked about the Auburn defense when we talked to Ted Roof, the defensive coordinator this week. He's telling us, you know, my, my first 11 guys are pretty good, mm -hmm. but we don't have a lot of depth. There's yep. Ted, former head coach at Duke and former all-ACC linebacker at Georgia Tech back in his playing days. Well, his biggest concern was Tennessee being a team that was going to line up and try to pound them and run the football. And I think his group has held up pretty well I so far. Too. Robert thinking about a blitz. And Hardesty's going to go down as a flag is down as well. Tom Ritter, the head of our officiating crew. Well, after making a serious statement with a win at Dover, defending champ Jimmy Johnson still got his sights set on current points leader and ageless wonder Mark Martin Chase for the NASCAR Sprint Cup continues in Kansas. Coverage starts tomorrow, 1 o'clock Eastern on ABC. For more information, log on to ESPN.com. So the penalty declined, and it brings up, guess what? <laughs> Third down and long. This time, 11. Well, last time they picked up about nine and then went on fourth and shorts. They'd rather not make a living doing that. Crompton down the middle. In and out of the hands of his intended receiver. And behind his intended receiver again. This time Lane Kiffin's going to punt the football. And it's about the fourth or fifth throw we've seen from Jonathan Crompton on an in route or a crossing route that is behind the receiver. It's hard for a receiver to stop and reach back and, and change directions to make that catch. So Cunningham has been a busy punter set to kick again. Again, not a good kick unless it gets a big Tennessee roll, which one of his tonight did. This one doesn't. And it goes down to about the 29 yard line. That's where Auburn takes over with a 10 point lead. 106 remaining in the quarter. Well, Eric Berry tonight, uh, he, he's been in the back end, the safety position most of the time. It hasn't been a vintage Eric Berry night. He's missed a few tackles, which we don't see very often. He hasn't had any real throws his way where he's had a chance to get his hands on the football, but still uh, the leader of this Tennessee defense and at any time capable of making a big time play for the volunteer. On the ground is Tate. Tennessee waiting for him. Pick up of maybe two. Rico McCoy's been a busy linebacker tonight. Ben Tate, well, he's not going to hurt himself in the conference rushing statistics, that's for sure. As he's got 109 so far, and we still have a quarter to go. Going to bring some pressure off the corner on Todd. He has to get rid of it in a hurry. The ball's up in the air. Is it intercepted? I think so. I think Montario Hughes has got it. Montori Hughes 
All 312 pounds of him lays out for the catch of the night. Well, it's going to be a question of whether he got his hands on the ball. Eric Smith was the intended receiver. Oh, oh that ball was on the ground. Oh, boy. <laughs> That's too bad. It was a great attempt, and it looked good in real time. Yeah. But you see the ball is trapped. <laughs> Oh, he's excited, but I'm afraid that's not going to be the case. We'll have an official review, and we'll be back. Yeah, better put your helmet back on. <laughs> now, the freshman out of Murfreesboro, Tennessee, I think probably knows by now that uh, this official review is not going to go in his favor. Here's another look. Eric Smith bobbled it on the pass across the middle, and Montori did a great job of trying to scoop it, and then the acting job afterwards, which maybe, quite frankly, he maybe thought he did catch it, yeah. and that it didn't hit the ground. But the official review is still going on upstairs. If they see what we saw, it's going to bring up a third down and about eight. But you know what? For a six foot four, 312 pound oh. guy, I mean, you got to give some. Some serious credit for that play. Absolutely. The effort. Uh, that was a heck of an athletic play by a big man. Quite frankly, this one's taking a little longer than we would have expected. Well, I think they're figuring out the, the placement ball of the hit ball. the ground. Therefore, it's not an interception. It's an incomplete pass. It'll be Auburn's ball. Third down and eight. There'll be other days, big yeah. fella. <laughs> Look at his teammates are loving it. <laughs> you know, that's the fun of this game. You, you team might be down 10 and you got 15 minutes and 32 yeah. seconds to do something about it, but it's still supposed to be fun. <laughs> well, the other thing that's fun for Tennessee is it's third and eight. They got to fix the change because they I'm not sure they've got this set up by here. They go. They're getting it fixed third and eight. And Auburn is 4 of 13 on third downs tonight. The fans are aware of that. So is Chris Walker. Tennessee showing man coverage here with a single free safety. Todd lays it out in the flat. Michaela made two guys miss and comes back the other way. Wow. What a play by the freshman. He was... Dead in the water yeah. over there and put the brakes out and knew where he had to go. This is a situation where Tennessee had the right defense called at the right time. As you mentioned, two defenders where McCaleb's going, and he just made an instinctive football. Where Auburn trying to stay undefeated. There's Montori Hughes who almost made a diving interception. And boy, would that have been a momentum changer in this football game when Tennessee desperately needed one. As it is, Auburn starts the fourth quarter with a 16-6 lead. And the football almost at midfield. Tony Burns goes back into the backfield in motion as Todd fires to Adams. Nice throw and catch down to the 32-yard line first down. What a beautiful throw by Chris Todd again they fake play action then they fake reverse and then it's single coverage and Chris Todd throws a beautiful throw and that's uh, good timing on the route and the throw as well again Cody Burns sneaks toward the backfield but they go the other way on the handoff and Tate down about the 26 yard line well a score here for Auburn is going to make it awfully tough for a Tennessee offense to come back as the clock is winding its way towards 14 minutes and 113 yards for Ben Tate including the first touchdown of the night from 11 yards out and Auburn has run 27 more plays from scrimmage than Tennessee wow Aaron's already talked about the fatigue with the Tennessee defense I want to talk about the Auburn offense why they're not as fatigued Here's a swing pass out to Fannin. 
Fanu with a head of steam, first down, carrying volunteers down to the 11-yard line. And you say, well, what about the Auburn offensive linemen? Are they in that much better shape than Tennessee? No, but this is the way they've practiced ever since Gus Malzahn has been there. They practice this kind of tempo. Tennessee's defense tried to this week, but you can't get a scout team looking at plays on cards to run with the same speed and tempo and intensity that they were going to face in the game. So as much as you try to condition your team and prepare them, you can't simulate it in practice. So first down at 10. Here's the ball out. Screen pass touchdown to Rel Zucker. And one of the first things that shows up when a team is tired is they miss tackles. A couple of them on that play. Officially 11 yard touchdown. Wide receiver screen, one missed tackle, two missed tackle. Easy touchdown for Auburn. Terrell Zachary, one of our impact players tonight. He waited till the fourth quarter to impact the game with his fourth receiving touchdown of the year. The extra point is up and good. And as I said, if another score comes Auburn's way, it's going to be a long ways back for Tennessee. Well, that's the case at hand with 13-41 to play in the football game. A 70-yard drive and eight plays, about two and a half minutes again for Auburn. And the key play on that drive before the touchdown pass to Zachary was a third and eight when Todd found McCaleb on a 16-yard pickup that kept the drive alive. Now Tennessee doesn't have a lot of time to work with, and they've got to make up points in a hurry. Maybe New Keys Richard can, Richardson can do it for them. Oku trying to find a little avenue, and nice return out to about the 38-yard line. Well, if you're living in the Boston area and you're a big Patriot fan, or maybe the Celtics, Bruins, Red Sox, whatever it might be, ESPNBoston.com has all your local coverage. ESPN.com for Boston and coming soon. ESPN.com for New York and L.A. You want to check it out. Brad Nessler, Todd Blackledge, Aaron Andrews. Time is of the essence. For the orange clad volunteers now 14 uh, 13 and a half minutes remaining and they trail by 17. Crompton going to throw shorts and Hardesty is going to make a first down out of it. Ontario out of the backfield nice play and they'll move the sticks we move to Reese Davis Reese. All right, Brad, we're going to get you up to date on Oklahoma, Miami. A lot going on in the last few minutes. A 14 10 Miami lead to Corey Harris would find Travis Benjamin. Dominique Franks was playing zone. Everybody else apparently playing man. Dominique got an earful from Bob Stoop. But the Sooners took advantage of a very questionable roughing the punter penalty. DeMarco Murray going in, and Oklahoma back within four on ABC. Right here, Tennessee trying to run the ball, and they lose two. And Auburn fired up defensively. Carter and Bynes combine on a hit on Hardesty. You know, I think it's interesting. When we talked to Gene Chiswick this week. He said, I don't really know about this team yet. I don't know how good we are. I think we got a chance to be pretty good, but I'm not sure. We'll know a lot more when we take our team on the road. And here on the road, they're doing the job. Yeah, I think people need to take this team Seriously, well, I mean, uh, it's a team in the SEC that's undefeated, not ranked in the top 25. They've got to be next week. Yeah, and they hang on here. I think they will be. It's a nice luxury, as Gene said. I don't think we're a very good team right now. He said, Coach, you're 4-0. And he said, no, I don't mean I won't take the four wins. Remember, they beat Mississippi State and they beat West Virginia. Not two bad football teams. But still, all those games were at home. Some of them were in some... Sloppy conditions where turnovers were key, but uh, hey, they're, they're still W's and they're on their way to their fifth W, yeah. it appears. Well, he's just such an understated guy. I, I think he's an excellent football coach. I was on the field before the game. They're introducing over the PA, the starters and the head coaches. They didn't even say his name right. They said Gene Kizik. <laughs> Fourth down. Tennessee's got to have something to work for him. Crompton, he got something to work for him. Gerald Jones. And a first down, a pickup of 11. 
This is a nice, strong throw by Jonathan Crompton and Gerald Jones, who I thought was going to be a bigger factor tonight, finally gets involved Ooh. in the plan. He caught it twice. Yeah. Now back to the ground game. Hardesty, nice spin move the first time, but Auburn got him the second time as Darren Bates, the freshman safety, made the stop. Darren Bates, boy, Ted Roof and the rest of the coaches of Auburn said, you know, we got the kid out there. It looked like he was totally lost until we put pads on, and then he started popping people, yeah. and he's done a nice job back there tonight. Yeah, he is. He's a true freshman, and uh, they've kept things fairly simple because of that. Screen pass set up to the left. Broken tackle by Hardesty. Monterio Hardesty's gone. Much like late in the second quarter when Tennessee had to find some offensive life to stay in the game. They do on a 31 yard screen pass to Hardesty. And much like two weeks ago down in Gainesville when they found themselves down 23 to 6 in the fourth quarter they found a way to get back in it. They're back in it. Still a long way to go but it's a lot better than it was a couple of minutes ago. 23 13 Tennessee still alive. Tennessee River earlier today. Wind died down. Beautiful night. This is a scene while we were away. There is still life in the Volunteers. Ontario Hardesty has given them that hope, capping a 62-yard drive in two minutes. Boy, he's having a great senior season. Is he? I just ever. love to see that. Yep. Guy battled through injuries. Only a thousand yards in his three year years combined. He is well on his way to a huge final season. Kick to the seven to McCaleb. We had a big play on Auburn's last drive. McCaleb. <laughs> Boy, he's going to be something special. He already is. Out to the 45 yard line, out to Reese Davis. All right, Brad, Sports Center right now. Baseball American League Central is going to come down to the final day. Twins beat the Royals 5 4. White Sox beat the Tigers 5 1. Michael Kadire going yard to give Minnesota the winning margin. They are tied for the Central lead. LSU and Georgia came right down to the end under a minute to go. Charles Scott scored from 33 yards out, 20 to 13. Sports Center after the game. State current ESPN News. College football final follows Sports Center. How about the rush by the Minnesota Twins? They get within distance of winning the Central American League. 23-13. Auburn good field position. Whistles before the snap. Prior to the delay of game foul, we had a timeout called by Auburn. Ooh, they saved themselves five yards, but at what cost, maybe? Depending on how the rest of the game should go. 11:27 remaining here. Time to take a look at our Buffalo Wild Wings top 30 plays of all time. Here's number 25. Buffalo Wild Wings presents the top 30 plays of the last 30 years. 25. Trailing Georgia by three late in the 1982 Sugar Bowl, the Pittsburgh Panthers chose against kicking a field goal on fourth down. That's when Dan Marino found tight end John Brown on a 33-yard touchdown pass with 35 seconds remaining, giving the Panthers the win and Marino one of his many fourth-quarter comebacks. Follow the top 30 countdown all season long. Brought to you by Buffalo Wild Wings. Danny's hair's not as curly. Yeah. It still looks good. And Pitt beat Georgia that year in the Sugar Bowl, and we uh, played them and beat them the next year. Two teams from the Northeast winning in the Sugar Bowl. <laughs> First down at the 45. Ben Tate had a big night, and he adds to it with six more yards. You now, we talked about this offense. What were some of the defining characteristics of it? We've seen the shotgun. We've seen the motion and the shifting. We also said balance. Well, right now, 210 yards rushing, 213 yards passing for Auburn. I'd say that's pretty good balance. <laughs> sure is. And they still could end up with 500. As they have coming in, the number three team in the country in total offense with 526. Tate 
Trying to use a stiff arm. It's not going to work. Savvy and Frazier, the middle linebacker, again on the hit. Working our way toward the 10-minute mark. That was a huge play by Frazier because not only does it bring up third down, but it was a loss of yardage play. So instead right. of being third and four or less, it backs him up a little bit to third and seven. Crowd is trying to help their defense. That's where Chris Walker for Tennessee needs to make a play as well. Todd loads and fires in and caught by Fannin, but an open field tackle by Rico McCoy. Well, that's the same problem that has kind of plagued Jonathan Crompton tonight. Crossing route, a pass thrown behind the receiver. Fannin had to slow down to catch it. And by the time he regathered himself, he had lost all his momentum, and Tennessee was able to tackle him short of the first down. Here comes the punting unit for Auburn on a fourth down and two yards to go. Durst would like to drop one inside the 10 yard line. Not a good punt again. But the roll is scooped up by Nukees Richardson. He did what he could to get some positive yardage. There's a positive vibe, at least, in Neyland Stadium. Can Jonathan Crompton and Tennessee come from behind? Stick around. Neyland Stadium in Knoxville. <laughs> that right elbow can get sore, especially when you're getting knocked around while you're trying to throw. Scoring by quarters. Auburn has scored in every quarter in every game. This is one game they have not had to come from behind, which they have done in the four previous wins they've had this year. They've been in front throughout. Crompton deep middle. Oof. Josh Bynes got a hand on it. And Jonathan Crompton had no idea where Josh Bynes was. He was looking left. He was looking at his receiver, and he has no idea where number 17 is. Watch. He's just reading him, reading him, reading him, and steps right in front of the play. He's looking for Stalker, who has been his favorite target tonight. Second down at 10. Tennessee all its timeouts. Crompton's been a lot better after a shaky start. They need him to get hot again, and he does here. Hardesty's got it to the 30, and that's a first down. Well, they put Hardesty out as a wide receiver that time. He got him out there in coverage and shows you his hands out of the backfield. And now Tennessee hurries things up with just under nine minutes to play. Crompton fires again. Tough pass and a tough catch by Jones, who's out of bounds. Tennessee would love to give Auburn a little taste of its own medicine by hurrying things up here with that ball knocked. Or the receiver knocked out of bounds. The clock has stopped momentarily now. 8.39. And running. Crompton doesn't like the look. May have changed the play. Wants to throw to the sideline. Oh, it's the second man time. Open. The second time they've tried that route to Hancock. And uh, the first time Hancock dropped it, this time it was a bad throw. Hancock was in the slot. They get the little pick play on the outside, and that time the ball was poorly thrown by Crompton. Six throws toward number 87, and he has only one catch. As Todd said, that one was uncatchable. Third and four. Got to think first down here. Not get too greedy. You still got plenty of time to work with. There is the first down to Hardesty. Boy, good hard run. Yeah. You know, whenever they need a tough physical run, this is the guy that gives it to him. I mean, Bryce Brown is going to be an outstanding running back here for Tennessee, but Montario Hardesty is just a more physical guy. I mean, he's three years older than him, which has a lot to do with that. First down, Tennessee keeps it moving. Now Crompton flushed out of the pocket. He's going to get what he can and dive across the 45. 
Auburn. Again, trying to line his guys up in a hurry. Auburn trying to substitute defensive linemen, putting four new guys in. Keep their starters as fresh as they can here in the fourth quarter. This time they're waiting for Hardesty. Stevens and Thorpe on that side make the stop. I don't think that Tennessee has to panic time-wise at this point, but on a play like that, Hardesty might be better to get what you can and get out of bounds. Stop the clock when you can so that you don't lose a lot of extra time. Crop to the slant. It's caught. It's a first down at the 44-yard line. They Hancock finally got on the finally. same page, didn't they? There we go. <laughs> they had different books. They yeah. had different pages. Finally, they got one. And it couldn't have come at a better time for Tennessee. Approaching seven minutes. Tennessee down 10. Crompton has a look at that wristband. Send Stocker is tight end out in the slot to the right. Five receiver grouping. He's in the shotgun on first down. Over the middle, trying to tuck one in. Ooh. Close. Marcellus Teague, the freshman, almost held on to that thing. And if he could have and broken away, he's another guy with great speed. Yeah. Well, that looked like there was an Auburn defender hanging on to him as he was trying to catch the football. Tenth play of the Tennessee drive. The only good thing there is the clock stopped with the incomplete pass. No chance for Tennessee to regroup here for second down. Bryce Brown comes out as a wide out down to the bottom of your screen. They threw toward Hardesty in that spot last time. They're going to try the same thing, but this one's just thrown out of bounds to have another play to play with for Crompton. Third down at 10. Well, Todd, they got a third and four and a third and three on this drive. They need another one here, or at least they need part of it and then go on fourth down. Yeah. You might not see the ball again. Well, I think you're in two down territory because you've got to, you've got to score twice anyway. So even if you can't score a touchdown here, you're out of field goal range right now. So you've got to go four down territory here. Hardesty back in there for Tennessee. Crompton fires far side, got his man, but it's going to be run out of bounds at the 40-yard line for Denarius Moore. And it's fourth down and six. So this could be the ball game right here. And this is going to require Jonathan Crompton sticking a throw in there. I mean, you know, he, he hasn't had a great night. He's made a couple throws when they've needed it. They've had guys open on crossing routes tonight. But he has not been consistent keeping the ball in front of his receivers on those crossing routes. Hancock caught the last one on a slant. He's to the left. Stocker, the tight end, is over on the right-hand side. Here's a fourth down and maybe the last chance for Tennessee. Crompton lofts it. Got his man, and it's Hancock. First down. Third time they tried the same play. This time they threw it to the left. Hancock's in the slot. They run a little pick play, and it's out over the outside shoulder. And this time they connected on it for a big first down. Third time, same play, one for three, but it happened at the right time. To the 22-yard line, first and 10. Clock winding towards five and a half to go. Back to the ground they go. Monterio Hardesty down to the 13-yard line. Tennessee with a touchdown can make it a field goal game. Again, they hurry up to the line. 14th play of the volunteer drive. Crompton blitz off the corner. He throws that way. Complete down to the six to more. And the clock stops to set the chains. And again, Tennessee is in a two-minute offense mode because they need two scores, and they want to keep as much time as possible. And they're not trying to work the clock here. They want time, and they need two scores. First and goal for the Volunteers. Back to the ground. And this one stopped short by Jake. They may Ritz. want to call a timeout here. They're just... They're going to run a play yeah. in. And they're going to huddle up and make sure they get the right call. I mean, obviously, you want to make sure your communication is right here. Jeff Cotton, the second tight end, brought the play in. Second and goal. 
They fake it to Hardesty. At the last moment, Crofton throws, and he had caught him over there. Oh, man. Third down a goal. He was looking short to try to get rid of the ball quick, and caught him was open late in the back of the end zone. Caught him slipped a little bit, and maybe that's why Crofton yeah. decided to throw it away, but he ended up being wide open. Dottom's the guy that brought the play in. He was the guy they wanted to go to. Wow. Now they're shifting Brandon Warren way back to this near side. Third and goal. Obviously, two down territory for Tennessee. Crompton and flags down. Well, they threw flags because the play clock ran out. Lane Kiffin was trying to run down the sideline to call timeout before that happened to Jonathan Crompton. The problem started when Warren was lined up on the wrong side and they had to switch him. Snap infraction on the center. Five yard penalty remains third down. I don't know that I don't know that that's the worst thing that could happen though. That ten that timeout. You know if you score here in two plays from yeah. the ten yard line you just soon have that timeout. And not worry about the penalty. Bryce Brown in. You can see the ball fans biting their nails, holding their breath, hoping for a comeback. Crompton. Tipped. Somebody got a hand on it. Mike Blank, I think, is the guy. Yeah, you got to kick the field goal here because you've got to have two scores. You don't want to waste it down here. Get three and then count on your defense. See if you can get a three and out. They should have gotten a little rest on the last couple possessions to give you a great effort. Remember, Lincoln has missed a field goal, and he's had an extra point blocked. He's going to try to close the gap to one score from 26 yards out from the left hash. Got to have this, and they do get it. Lincoln's field goal has made it 23 to 16. Some drama left at Neyland Stadium. A one score game here at Neyland Stadium in Knoxville. Coming up, Sports Center after the game. Last minute thrillers LSU and Georgia, Michigan, Michigan State may be here too. We're not done yet. Great Irish escape. The Rockies and the Dodgers in progress. Steve Levy and John Anderson. Guys will have all the scores, highlights, and everything when we're done. But we still got 419 to go, and that was an all important drive. Knowing they needed two scores, though they had to settle for three. Daniel Lincoln's field goal capped a 72 yard drive in 18 plays for Tennessee. Just under five minutes to close the gap to 23 16. Very important for Tennessee to have good discipline on their kick coverage here. You remember the last kickoff, McCaleb was able to bring it out pretty well. Yep. Get Auburn started in excellent field position. They've got to get a good deep kick and then discipline coverage here to put their defense in the best position to get a stop. Cunningham, the punter, is also obviously, as you've seen all night, been the kickoff man. Let's see if he can get a hold of one here or keep it away from those guys back here. Going to go down to about the nine to McCaleb. Same guy. Here's what Todd was talking about. Chipped up. Oh, he would have scored. Cunningham saved a touchdown. Just what you were talking about, a 52-yard return. Yeah, I mean, you, you get all this momentum with your offense. You know your defense is rested and ready to play, but now you give Auburn a short field because it's a short kick. They get out of their lanes on their coverage and give credit to Auburn. And they've got an excellent return game right now tonight. McCaleb has proven that he knows what to do with it when he gets it. They get on their blocks, and Auburn is set up on the 39 of Tennessee. Todd on the pitch to Tate, who puts the brakes on and wants to reverse his field. Tate got the corner, got a block. He made something out of nothing yeah. there. He got about nine yards. That should have been about a four-yard loss, and Ben Tate turns it into a nine-yard game. Well, I don't know what happened everywhere else in the SEC today, but Georgia gave up two long kick returns to LSU that cost them dearly. Yeah in their loss today in Athens and now the same thing might just happen here in the last four minutes. Auburn by a touchdown. 
All they need to do is chew up clock. And they're doing that right now. Yeah, I mean, this is this is uh, anti Gus Malzahn offense, but it's <laughs> it's wisdom yes, right now. I mean, absolutely. Use as much clock as you can and uh, use the clock to your advantage. Snap it at the last moment. If you only get a yard here, that's good. They got the first down. Had they only gotten a yard, it still wouldn't have mattered. They would have had all kinds of time. But Caleb, he's getting a little stiff too here late in the fourth quarter. Timeouts. Boy, it had ruined a night that Ontario Hardesty again has had, and it's been a beauty. This should be a beauty, too. Monday night at the Metrodome, ESPN's Monday Night Football. Packers and Vikings, 8.30 Eastern. Coverage starts with Monday Night Countdown, served by Applebee's at 7 Eastern. Aaron Rodgers on the left, the guy that took over for Brett Favre when he went to the Jets, and now with the Minnesota Vikings. <laughs> That's going to be something. Yeah. And, and do you think if Green Bay happens to go in there and win, do you think Aaron Rodgers will finally feel like he gets about an 800-pound yeah. gorilla off his back? Probably. Yeah. Of That's course, uh, Brett Favre, you know, even the people in Minnesota through the first couple of weeks, well, well he's throwing these six-yard passes and everything. It's all Adrian Peterson and Tavares Jackson or Sage Rosenfels could have done all that. They changed their tune with two seconds yeah. to go last week in the back <laughs> of the end zone. Now, Everybody wants a number four jersey. Yeah. I think my mom has ordered a Brett Favre jersey. Not that she doesn't look great in purple. <laughs> but it's still weird to see him in purple. Yeah. Gene Chiswick, boy, if he gets out of Knoxville at 5-0, and oh, he's going to be one happy guy. Lane Kiffin still hoping that somehow his team can get their hands on it offensively again. And try to score one more time. Cody Burns now. In in the Wildcat for Auburn. Several times tonight the linesman has stopped play to go out to get the referee's attention. So they'll have a conference over on the near sideline. Please reset the game clock at three minutes 13 seconds. 313. Yeah, that's quite quite a big difference. Chris Todd is split out as a wide receiver in this set. To the top of your screen with yeah. Cody Burns, the guy that's in the shotgun. That's Chris Todd, the starting quarterback. I gotta believe Auburn's gonna run the ball here and not have Cody Burns throw at this part of the of the game. And Cody will go on the left side inside the 25. And the clock will be at three minutes. So three minutes remaining in the football game. You know, you always say that you wish we didn't have polls until October because preseason doesn't mean much. This would be your top five right now, right? Right now it would be. And really the one and two could be one and one A because I think both of them are, are, I think they're the two best right now that I've seen. I think Alabama is getting better and better. I think Florida, you know, defensively they're both about the same. Right. The difference for me in Florida being number one is Tebow. I, I just think that, you know, he's a guy that you never want to go against, I don't think. Texas, I think they're hitting their stride. Uh, Virginia Tech, their one loss. Uh, I know there's other undefeated teams, mm -hmm. but I, I like their only loss was to Alabama. Alabama in the open. Uh, they're getting better. And then that number five, I had Oklahoma. I mean, they could be getting beat tonight, you know, in Miami, and they don't have their quarterback, Sam Bradford. I just still think they are a very, very I good had, football team. I had them in my number five, too. Here's my uh, – I had Alabama number one, Florida, and Texas. How do you like my number four? Ooh. Ooh, the Bearcats. <laughs> yeah. Give them the Bearcats, the Bearcats a little love. You want to go to historic Nippert. You knew you? you knew Aaron was going to have Florida, but that's okay. She, they, they, hey, come on. <laughs> Four and five was hard for me. It was a toss-up. I tell you what, LSU had to hang on for dear life. Those are our top fives the three of us came up with in our secret ballot in the meeting this morning. A little bit of difference. Auburn takes a timeout now. So all they're trying to do is... Pick up a couple more first downs. Tennessee does have two timeouts remaining. 
Let's check in with Erin now that we know what her top five is. <laughs> I'll explain it to you in a minute. First, I want to tell you about uh, Savvy Frazier, who we talked about at the beginning of the game. You guys mentioned holding his own for not playing this position since sixth grade. Well, he's cramping up. He's trying to hang on right now, guys. Hydrating, talking to some coaches, but he's limping around. And the last couple of plays there, he's just been trying to move. Anyways, about my top five, I was... <laughs> I like it. You know, like I said, four and five was hard. But as I was talking to some people with College Football Live, I think that's the one that everybody's kind of trying to figure out here. And saw a little bit about LSU. We'll yeah. see a lot more, learn a lot more about them next week as well. That's right. And the big question that will be on the minds of everybody all week is about Tim Tebow and whether or not they're playing that game. Finally, after timeouts all over the place, second down and six for the Tigers. Trying to. Ice this thing away. Then Tate trying to help him, but Rico McCoy with another tackle. will force a third down. Tennessee takes another timeout. Boy, Rico McCoy's had a big night, too. That Tennessee defense has been out there a long time. And obviously, with guys cramping up out there, that's part of the problem. Well, defending champ Jimmy Johnson still has his sights set on Mark Martin. Chase for NASCAR Sprint Cup continues at Kansas. Starting with our coverage at 1 o'clock Eastern on ABC tomorrow. You know what? We showed you Todd's Taste of the Town earlier. John from Washington, D.C. is the winner of Todd's Taste of the Town. You have to go to ESPN.com and look up Taste of the Town. He says, my mother-in-law just moved in and I need to get away to my native East Tennessee. I'll take my hundred bucks. I'll meet up with my brother and I'll eat ribs and fried chicken till I pop. Yeah. You, you notice John didn't leave his last name. I, so I, we don't I, know I what mother in law full that. of money because he's going to need more than a hundred bucks. I think after that. That was Todd's menu and all the places that he's dined since we've started this season. Swing pass. Did Smith step out of bounds? He gets down to the five yard line. It doesn't matter. This a, a great call and a great play by Chris Todd. Third down. They passed on the run. And, uh, you know, Chris Scott said they kind of pounding the nail in the coffin there with that little hand signal, and that's exactly right. They fake Chris Todd. Beautiful throw to the sideline and an all-important first down for the Auburn Tigers. Linesman was right there with him, so while he was going, at a high rate of speed, he stayed inside the chalk mark and got it down to first and goal. Two forty-five. So for a team that was five and seven overall last year, they're two minutes and forty-five seconds away from being five and zero oh this year. You know they were four and zero oh last year to start the season, and then they lost to Auburn. Came back and won a, a, a hard fought low scoring game against Tennessee and then things really kind of unraveled for Auburn. And uh, Gene Chizik came in. A lot of controversy about him being hired but you know he was a defensive coordinator at right. Auburn prior uh, at a time when Auburn was playing great football. In fact his last year at Auburn they were undefeated and uh, kind of left out of the national championship picture. But 2004 was about as good as it got for Auburn in a long time. That's the last time Auburn was in Knoxville and he was that defensive coordinator and they did go 13 and 0 and uh, they won here and now they're about ready to win for the fifth straight time in this series which Auburn's never done over Tennessee in the 50 previous outings this being the 51st between the two schools. Everybody arguing over the amount of time I guess it's uh, supposed to be back on the clock. They've changed it a couple of times already. You know, the other thing that Gene Chizik said that really helped him. In coming back to Auburn, even though the, the, the choice of him as the head coach may not have been real popular in the public's eye, with former players and former Auburn Tigers, there was tremendous support. And, and so he had credibility among former players, and that really rubbed off on current players. And he was really well accepted within the family at Auburn. And uh, I think, uh, again, if he ends up going 5 and 0 after tonight, there'll be a little bit more widespread acceptance of Gene Chizik and his staff. We'll be down there on Toomer's Corner tonight going, you know what? 
That was a, that was a good hire. <laughs> <laughs> and then throw a roll of toilet paper. Yeah. Cody Burns in the Auburn backfield. Got John Douglas, the fullback, back there with him. First and goal at the five. That part doesn't really matter as long as they can just eat up the remainder of the clock. And Tennessee's got to take its last time out. Todd, you were talking about the little bit of controversy when Gene Chizik was hired, and then how about a lot of the controversy that Lane Kiffin created in the SEC when he kind of made a few coaches and programs mad. If you talk about a buzz meter, you know, when you talk about these great Google searches that are out there, Lane Kiffin Googled uh, 20 times more than Gene Chizik, and he was mentioned about three times more on, on blogs. And when you see what that all does, you know, Lane Kiffin said, hey, I stirred it up with, you know, a lot of these coaches. I got our name out there because it's good to talk about Tennessee. It helps in recruiting. You see about the recruiting rankings for the class of 2010. As you guys mentioned early in this uh, game here, Gene Chizik just said, yeah, that's not really my style. The SEC, there's, everybody's talking about it anyways. I don't really need that. Well, you got to do what you're comfortable with. I mean, you can't be a phony. You can't be what you're not. And I think both of these guys, Lane Kiffin and Gene Chizik, were, have been kind of true to themselves and their personalities. And, you know, Kiffin came in kind of brash, and uh, it's worked for him the way he wanted. And Gene Chizik has come in kind of understated and conservative, and it's worked for him as well. Todd back in there at quarterback for Auburn. We've got everybody loaded to the right side. Ben Tate takes it straight up the middle for maybe a yard. Tennessee can't stop the clock again. So Gene Chizik, who said, you know, it's not me. It's never been about me. People are going to pay attention to you if you're really bad or you're really good. He said, I like the attention that comes with winning. It looks like they're going to win their fifth straight game, and now they're going to get some attention from the pollsters. Yeah. And if they're not in the top 25 next week, I don't know who's voting. And all of a sudden, uh, potentially another voice to be heard from in the SEC West. How about you that? Know, everybody knew it was Alabama and LSU, and of course, Ole Miss was kind of the, yeah. you know, the uh, new sweetheart yeah, over there. The new sweetheart, but uh, don't go to sleep on Auburn. Now to a minute and a half. Tate, at this point you just try to find a place to land sort of in that sea of orange defense. Boy, you just have to go back to that kickoff return too yeah. by Michaela because it just it just changed the whole dynamic here. It put, the, it put so much advantage with Auburn in the plays that they could call, the time they could use. It set them up at the Tennessee 39 and then all they needed was really a couple of first downs and to force Tennessee to use their timeouts. He's going to run this clock down as far as he can and then call timeout. So now the clock stopped with 42 seconds with the Auburn timeout. 42 seconds remaining. Auburn by seven. Auburn won a year ago, 14 to 12 in this game. And they lead the series. I mentioned they having won the last four, but this is going to be uh, uncharted territory. If they hang on to win this one, it'll be five straight over Tennessee. Chris Todd, big smile on his face. One of the leaders of the team, obviously, but as we mentioned earlier, Cody Burns, the guy he beat out for the quarterback job, maybe just as big a leader from a whole different perspective for Auburn. You know, when Urban Meyer came to the SEC and brought his spread offense or his version of it, people wondered, can that offense work in the SEC? Well, I think he's proven that that's true. I'm sure a lot of people wondered if Gus Miles on's offense. And yeah, it worked at Tulsa, but can it work in the SEC? I think we've kind of Got a better answer on that tonight as well, because this is a good Tennessee defense. Byron from 22 to try to ice the game. He used to want to get it blocked, and he didn't. He hit it right down the middle. Now Ben Tate can breathe a sigh of relief. Gene Chiswick, there's a smile. 
He's going to let go a little bit. <laughs> he put it on his kicker because the last thing in the world is you want to block kick and a touchdown going the other way. So Auburn, now you start looking at their schedule. When you looked at it at the beginning of the year, you said, you know, he can't do it all in one season. Maybe they could somehow eke out seven wins. Now they're at Arkansas and Kentucky at LSU, Ole Miss, Furman, at Georgia in the middle of November, and then the Iron Bowl with Alabama to wrap things up. Now the good news for Auburn, and this has not always been the case, they play Georgia, and then they have a week off before they play Alabama. Yeah. Typically they have played that game back-to-back, -back, and it's always been hard for Auburn because those are two huge rivalries. The Georgia-Auburn game is a huge rivalry Absolutely. for both schools. And then, of course, in-state Auburn, Alabama at the end is, uh, is about as intense as it gets. So having that extra week off will really benefit the Tigers this year. Nick Revez, the injured middle linebacker, his substitute played very well tonight, but they could have used his leadership, obviously, on the field. Dejected Eric Berry on the sideline, the All-American and SEC Player of the Year last season on defense. I guess if you got a some kind of gimmick play where you throw it from one side of the field to the other to try to break this for a long touchdown is maybe the only hope that the Volunteers have left. Oop, the bouncing ball goes inside the 10 though to Richardson. He has to shag it down there and he got only to about the 21 yard line. Well Tennessee they're going to drop to two and three. And here's what they've got coming up. Date with Georgia next. Georgia stinging from their loss to LSU, then at Alabama. That's certainly no day at the beach. South Carolina, Memphis, at Ole Miss, Vandy, in one of their rival games, then at Kentucky. Yeah, the real tough part of Tennessee's schedule is this month, the month of October. Those four games in this month, very, very difficult. Crompton fires after rolling out. Flags fly at the end of the play. That's complete to Hancock. Parker on the play. Here's the call. Personal foul. Roughing the passers. Number 93 defense. 15 yard penalty. First down. And Mike Blank. With the personal foul, so automatic first down. Here's the end of the play. Oh, yeah, you don't need that. Yep. Oof. Not to mention a helmet right under the chin. And while that was a personal foul, the league may take a look at that one on Monday and see if uh, there should be any other action taken against Blank. I don't think you need to hit a quarterback right in the chin when you're winning the ball game after he's completed a throw. And spiking the ball with 11 seconds remaining is Crompton. We've got time for a couple more plays. The luxury of not having your headset on, knowing that you're going to win the game, even though your defensive coordinator is still wearing his on one sideline, and Lane Kiffin. Still looking at that chart, still wearing his headphones, still talking to his quarterback. In a game that looks to be over, barring a miracle. Crompton tips. Almost caught by Stocker, his tight end. I bet, beg your pardon, it's caught on the other tight end. Caught him an even bigger target than Stocker at 6 8. Uh, the one thing for Tennessee, and obviously you're always, as a coach, as a player, you hate losing, but you always want to try to look for some kind of silver lining. That The one thing I would say is we were here a couple weeks ago for UCLA. They showed more flashes today offensively than they did when we were here two weeks ago. And something more to build on than we saw against UCLA. Well, there's one more bright spot at the final tick. Denarius Moore from 32 yards out. It's going to make the score look better. Could have used that one earlier in the ball game. <laughs> a 
Lane wanted to go for two and try to make it a two point loss, but uh, <laughs> the game gonna, is over. Going to have to be right there. That's as close as it's going to come. It's going to look better, I guess, when you take a look at it if you haven't watched the game, but uh, it's still a loss is a loss. And for Auburn, a win is a win, and they do win it to go to 5 0. Oh. Aaron's with a winning coach. 5 0. Oh, you told us, I have no idea how good this team is. What did you learn about them tonight? Well, it's a resilient football team. You know, we're, we don't always play real well. It, it's not always pretty. Somehow or another, our guys find a way to win, and I'm so proud of them because it's a young football team. And we're just feeling each other out, but some ways, somehow, we find a way to win. What impressed you the most about your guys? Just that they kept coming at it. You know, again, it, you know, we didn't play well all night, but they never lose focus. They always keep plugging. We're finding ways to win. Special teams are coming through. Just different ways to win every week, and I'm really proud of them. For. You told us you couldn't find a weakness in Tennessee's defense. So why was your offense able to have success? Well, you know, Monty, that defense is a great defense, and, and we're doing a really good job on offense. And again, we didn't play great all night, but we did enough to win the game. I got to give them a lot of credit. They were they were a great defense tonight. We just came up on the on the winning end. Enjoy being five and zero. Oh. Thanks. Thank you. All right, Brad. They hadn't been on the road before. They'd never played five night games in a row until tonight. They've now won five straight from Tennessee. Auburn 26, the Volunteers 22. For Todd Blackledge, Aaron Andrews, and our entire crew, Brad Nestle saying so long from Knoxville. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. Sports Center with Steve Levy and John Anderson is next.